Hi everyone, this is Sara Roversi from the Future Food Institute uh, and we are very glad to kick off uh, in next uh, another chapter of our incredible relay that started this morning very early for us from Fiji Island to celebrate World Food Day and overall to hear and highlight all the different voices of food systems. This is Voice of Food Systems Live. So today we're gonna run all around the world really to try to raise the awareness about how crucial it is to reshape food systems and fix food system and talk and share ideas on how we can achieve the sustainable development goals working together. And I'm super glad to host a new session hearing voices from Asia and connecting people from many different sectors, really watching how communities are now in different perspectives from different worlds, from different sectors, really moving towards uh, the sustainable development framework. We titled this session, Planet People Prosperity. And we strongly believe that we cannot live healthy in a sick world. And so we need really to work from different environments to fix the system. So today in this session, there's going to be friends, friends working in different fields from NGOs, VC, people working with industries, big industries, young activists, chefs, people that every single day have to take decisions. And those decisions can have impact on the health of people and on the health of the planet. So I'm going to introduce you my great voices. And in this session, we are going to have different representatives. I see that we have Jean connected by phone. So I'm going to start with Jean. He is the founder and president of Good Food Fund. I am super glad because they just got a, a great award, a very important award uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation. And I'm gonna start uh, hearing from him. What's the experience uh, and uh, what's the goal of this project? Which are the challenges uh, they are facing? Uh, say, starting from a country that is a very important country where their president was making a very important statement uh, during the United Nations General Assembly last September, China. So Yi, are you hearing us? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Happy World Food Day. Happy World Food Day. <laughs> nice. what, a, what a fun thing you're organizing. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome, of course, yeah. of course. So please tell yeah. us, uh, what are you doing in China? What's the goal of your foundation? Which are the challenges you're facing? Uh, and let's say, how do you see the, the future of the food systems? Yeah, do you mind me uh, if I share my screen? Please go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me try. Uh, okay, can you see from the, yeah, I, I put it on full screen. Yes. Great. Uh, yeah, I know I have only five, seven minutes. Um, uh, so the name of our organization is... Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Yes, we can. I'm going to lost you. Hello? Yeah, yeah. All is good. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, perfectly. Yes, we can. We can hear you. We can. Hello? Yes. We can hear you. It cannot. Let's see. Maybe he's on mute. No, oh, it doesn't seem to be a mute, actually. The mic is, uh, is on, but it's typing in a different chat. Maybe so we can press the next one and maybe he come back to you, Ijan. Yeah. Later. Okay, hi, hi. Okay, you make it. Yeah, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Okay, great, great. Sorry, I, no, I have to be quick then. Yeah, so the name of our organization is called the Good Food Fund. 
uh, we're part of a national foundation, and our goal is to promote good food to improve human health and, and animal health and planetary health. And of course, we do this because we, we see our shared risks uh, on public health, on uh, climate, on our um, ecosystem, food security, zoonotic diseases, and of course, animal welfare, which we think is challenging our human values, basic human values. And of course, we have our, you know, we see our shared future. Uh, that's why we are, you know, putting out so much effort in, in, in working on the our food system here in China. Um, so we, last year, we, uh, we also do our work based on uh, evidence-based science. So last year, we, host, we hosted the uh, China launch of the Eat Lanza report at our third Good Food Summit. And we really like this line from the, the Eat Lancer report about how important uh, changing our food system is to, to really help uh, optimize human health and our ecological system. And our focus has been on these three areas, but mostly on the first one, uh, more promoting more plant-based food here in, in China. And to do this, we actually came up with the Good Food Pledge, which we officially launched last year with a press conference. And um, we have eight principles for the uh, for Good Food Pledge, which we think will help us achieve the, our sustain, sustainability goal and uh, to, to, to help improve our food system, uh, which includes plant forward, animal welfare, healthy cooking, reducing waste, uh, recycling, supporting local agriculture, uh, supporting biodiversity, and uh, implementing food education. And uh, every year we have, uh, we organize the food, Good Food Summit, which is an annual gathering leadership conference focusing on food, sy food system transformation. We have had it for three years now. So actually the next one is coming up soon. Uh, it's on the Oct October the 28th and 29th. And we have many partners for this uh, conference. So uh, you can see from the list here, we work with uh, different universities and organizations like EAT and Slow Food uh, and FOLU. And every year we also organize uh, the Good Food Festival. You can see Paul here, Paul from the, uh, the, the Chef's Manifesto. Uh, he, he actually came to our Good Food Festival this year uh, in January, very luckily right before the, uh, the pandemic outbreak. Uh, we, has it, we had it in Beijing in the first week of January. So it's our uh, annual gathering for uh, chefs who support uh, good food uh, based on our good food pledge principles. And also we organize a food, food forward forum with Yale University. Uh, so last year we had the first edition of the food forward forum. We brought eight uh, top chefs from China to Yale and Harvard and, and, and several other universities. And we also connect universities as well. So we connect Peking University with, with uh, these US universities on how to improve their food services. And, uh, and also we have, uh, we have a new project called the Edible China, which uh, we do to promote biodiversity food initiative, uh, uh, local food to support local farmers, small farmers, as well as to enrich uh, the choices for plant-based food. And we have, uh, Sarah just mentioned, we, our Mama's Kitchen project just won the 2050 Food System Vision Prize by the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, the Mama's Kitchen focuses on uh, connecting uh, families, parents with uh, professional chefs and really uh, to develop uh, good recipes for plant-based food together. So it's like a, a plant-based lab laboratory slash uh, studio and slash uh, classroom. And we also have a market, wet market reform uh, project. You know, uh, because of COVID-19, uh, wet market has caught a lot of attention. Uh, so we, during COVID-19, we actually developed the idea of turning wet market into wet market, what we call wet market, a capitalized W-E-T, where W stands for well-being, E stands for ecology, T stands for transformation. So we basically imagine a future market to be uh, the, food, uh, the food hub of the urban food system. So instead of a, just a place where people buy and sell foods, it will become a place where 
people can learn and, and can play a role in the urban, in a better food, urban food system. And lastly, we also have been organizing uh, dialogues on China Global TV Network. Uh, we already had four episodes. So actually this week they are airing, they're airing three of the episodes. And uh, we also have top speakers from around the world uh, in this. So we, we are very happy that we are at a time when we think uh, this topic will, is catching more and more attention. And, and because as Sarah mentioned, um, President Xi Jinping has also made the commitment at the UN conference, at the UN um, assembly, which we think uh, as people working in the food system, we have a very big role to play uh, in, in helping our own country to, uh, to achieve these goals. So it's really exciting time and, and we really look forward to working together with all you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it's uh, really inspiring to see how China is moving fast and forward, uh, taking uh, many responsibilities uh, and, and doing big changes. And I'm going to come back to you later on, uh, but I'm going to stay in China. And I want to introduce my friend Matilda Ho. She's the founder of Bits for Bites. So always in China, but completely another environment because she funded the uh, venture firm that is investing uh, in technologies, innovation uh, that, of course, are all very keen on tackling uh, all the biggest challenges we are facing. We met many years ago, really at the beginning of our pathway, let's say, because uh, we were both uh, starting and building up our ecosystems. And I've seen her everywhere in stages, everywhere advocating for those issues and inspiring investors and big industries to, stay, to take this brave step. So Matilda, please share with us your projects and where you see that VC and investors can really say, play a crucial role in this time in history. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it's really my pleasure uh, to share some of my experience uh, from the eyes of an entrepreneur and also an investor. Um, and uh, I have been building two uh, food related ventures in the past five years. I'm the founder of Imi Shiji and Bits and Bites Ventures. Um, and to start with, uh, Imi Shiji um, is my new uh, first venture. It was established in 2015. It's one of the China's first online farmers market to promote organic, locally grown produce directly from farmers to consumers. And all the food that we bring and sell in our e-commerce platform is free from pesticides, chemical fertilizers, hormone and antibiotics. And it started with a very simple ver uh, mission. How can we create greater transparency of the food supply chain from farm to table and empower consumers to eat better, cleaner, and more mindfully? How can we reimagine the food supply chain for China? And also how can we rebuild our relationship with food and encourage consumers to think about where the food comes from? And after five years of running, we now serve more than 200,000 customers in China across um, different regions and supplying more than 700 fresh produce um, uh, from uh, uh, nearly 100 local farmers. And also to better respond to the rising consumer demands for the food products that are grown sustainable, minimally processed, ethically sourced, we decided to also start creating more and more private label products that are healthy and also made with natural ingredients. Um, for example, we created the first grass-fed hamburger patties uh, for the mothers, for kids, because they're just simply, you can't find any grass-fed hamburger patties in any retail channels in China. And what's more important, we started to work with the local farmers to help them to upcycle their fresh produce into preserved vegetables, local freeze-dried apple chips, uh, rice liquor, uh, et cetera, to extend their selling cycle um, to, in order to help them to increase their income and provide a more widely uh, product offerings. 
So as EME is starting to scale up to nationwide with on its path, uh, on its path to uh, more steady growth, I also started to realize with one food company, even one widely successful one food company can only put a dent on a long list of the food challenges that China is facing. Um, we need many more innovators to be able to make a real and scalable impact. Yet there was no sufficient food ecosystem and network of the community in China to foster the innovation and support entrepreneurs like myself. Um, so that's why in 2016, um, I started Bits and Bites and it's an early stage agriculture food focus VC platform to invest in early stage startups with transformative technologies to address the systematic challenges in China's supply chain. And those challenges include food security, food safety, sustainable <laughs> protein, human nutrition, as well as waste reduction. And all the companies that we invested is because their technology can be adopted and commercialized at scale in China. And that's where our values can come from to help the founders to reach at a commercialized um, Asian scale as quickly as possible. And now so far we have invested 14 companies um, and one of the company that tackle the crop and animal health is Tropic Biosciences. Uh, it's based in the UK and it's a bioscience company uh, using the gene editing technologies uh, to work on the banana issue from the deadly Panama disease, um, the TR4 diseases, and also the coffee beans um, has been facing a strict decline in their yield rate because of the climate change. And as we know that China has been facing uh, the African swine flu issue for sustainable animal protein, and its patented technology platform is also allowing them to working with uh, the leading breeding company to work on this issue for effective solutions. And another uh, company that we're very proud of um, is a company that we invested based in Jerusalem called Future Meat Technologies. And they are the, the company in uh, Jerusalem working with a, a series of innovation for the cell-based um, animal meat uh, production technologies. And so in after maybe five years or 10 years, imagine a world that we may be able to provide the animal protein directly from the stem cell of an animal grown in a bioreactor without slaughtering any further animals. And so to close up my stories, um, I wanted to remind everyone here that we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And no matter we are a CEO of a public company, of a startup, as a consumer, as a supplier, as an activist, as a chef, we are all, it's our duty together to build on the consumer mindfulness together. And every money that we spend, we're casting a vote for the type of the world that we want. So very glad to be here uh, with all the different industry, different expertise of people. I think this is why Sarah put us together to all work on the one mission together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matilda. Thank you so much. It was because if I start to collect the keywords that you are saying, I see that we are going to move forward to a more plant forward diet uh, that we all care about the planet, the health of people, but also we need to build prosperity. We need to be a prosperous world for, for our kids, healthy, green, and prosperous as well. Thank you so much. And we stay in the same field, talking about innovation, talking about the food industry. And now I wanna hear the voice of the industry. So this is the reason why I decided to invite Pierluigi Segismondi, who is the president of a big food industry. That is one of those presidents that actually are really keen on changing the system. Very brave, very brave because they just announced a promise, but not only a promise, they're also acting behind the scene with very, very impactful choices. So I want to hear the voice of the industry because uh, I know it's tough. When you have a small startup, 
it's easy to say, I'm going to change, this is my plan, and I'm going to be impactful in this way. But when you have uh, huge responsibilities, thousands of employees, and you know that your food, the food that you're producing, can impact on the health of thousands or millions of people, of course, uh, I think that this is a voice that needs to be heard. So Pierluigi, I want you to come on stage with me, and I want you to share your thoughts and share what you're doing. Well, oh, Sara, it's great to be here, and thanks for uh, giving me the space in this very exciting global UN food systems rally around the world, which is the first time for me to participate in this end-to-end -end, uh, connectivity that is happening uh, with so many great people. I was very inspired by Matilda's words. Uh, there is a lot to learn from you in how we can bring this diversity of great people and institutions together which is much needed to build systemic change in the world. I'm, I'm an optimist by nature and, and a hopeful person that believes in many advanced developments in food technology, agri-tech, genetic editing, as Matilda just mentioned, Tropy Biosciences is greatly positioning itself as a startup in the space of crop resilience, cultivation efficiencies, consumer health, and all these with very purpose-driven environmental practices. Um, I certainly believe that the Moore's law, which was invented by Mr. Moore in 1965, where he mentioned the, the fact of the speed in computing doubling every two years, uh, most likely applies also here. And we should see more exponential positive change uh, for the best of humanity and the best of the planet. <clears throat> I think humanity is certainly evolving, but frankly speaking, uh, we're not where we used to be, but we're not where we want to be. Uh, and this is the notion of transformation that uh, puts us continuously in the thinking mode that we are not where we used to be, but we are not yet where we want to be. I was watching last night a documentary from Sir David Attenborough, uh, who's a very eminent uh, voice in the space of environmental uh, concerns. And I left that call frankly speaking, very sad, realizing that the planet is really melting, that we chopped off 2 billion trees every single year, and that the most amazing species are disappearing in an irreversible change uh, that is led by human self-destruction. So I think time is now, uh, and this is the, the decade that truly matters, uh, where change is in our hands, and we can actually make this happen. Uh, people like Matilda and the other colleagues that are in this call certainly are driving transformational change, systemic change in the industry. And we in our company want to leverage that. Uh, COVID-19 has certainly doubled the number of people who are going uh, to bed uh, hungry every single day, uh, moving from 130 million to 260 million. It's a setback for the United Nations quest to achieve zero hunger. Uh, and I believe that with 2 billion people in the world not having regular access to safe, nutritious, and sufficient food, we certainly um, in the industry need to do much more. Uh, food insecurity is a problem that can only be approached through systemic change, where policymakers, industry, and civil society can all come together with common goals. And, and I would say from an industry and government point of view, we together can change um, a lot and we can accelerate this change. Effective tools can be provided by uh, institutions uh, at grassroots levels. So infrastructure development can happen with micro and, and micro policies that can kick off change. Uh, we think that uh, food security um, leads to undernourishment and starvation, but it is counterintuitive also to see that in reality, this is increasing obesity as well. Uh, Mississippi in the US is a state where 37% uh, of its population are having um, the highest level, the second highest level of adult obesity in the US. Um, we're working in the city of Jackson, uh, with one, which is one of the America's most unhealthy cities where there are only 20 grocery stores, 20 grocery stores for 160,000 people. And out of those stores, only 5% of them, only 5% sell actually fresh produce. And in contrast, these people are surrounded by 70 fast food restaurants and 150 gas stations only selling junk food. 
And, and these realities are the realities that actually need to be uh, changed. Uh, with the support of the mayor of the city of Jackson, Mr. Lumumba, we have partnered with other industry players, uh, local chefs, NGOs, the Boys and Girls Club uh, in the city to creatively bring nutritious foods in a sustainable way that can actually provide a food in a way that uh, it, it certainly helps all the underserved people in that city. Uh, we're now excited about how this is actually getting into the endemic fabric of the population and we're soon gonna be rolling this out to other five cities. So this experiment actually showing how when you truly partner with government agencies or uh, policymakers, um, you can really bring that systemic change to happen. From an industry perspective, I think business needs to progressively increase uh, its role in, in society. Um, there are many organizations that are taking positive steps. Uh, I'm only inspired by the work that the Nestle's and Unilever's of this world have done in building partnerships to tackle and alleviate food insecurity from a multi-stakeholder point of view, to reshape their supply chains, to encourage um, and improve smallholder farming, sourcing, distribution. Choban is another great company that has a charismatic founder and CEO who's an immigrant from Turkey uh, in the US, hiring refugees and employees that actually are now very purpose-driven, launching product lines uh, for which 100% of their profits goes to food banks. So although we're trying to actually bring impact to the world uh, through uh, the access that we want to provide to 1 billion people, uh, 1 billion people that should have the human right to access good nutrition, where we have committed to move away from any added sugars in our portfolio. We want to upscale, upcycle uh, losses from our farms uh, into nutrition that can be offered in affordable ways by removing every plastic that we have in our portfolio by 2025 in a carbon neutral supply chain that hopefully by 2030 uh, will generate no more greenhouse gas emissions as we also help communities and also please our shareholders because the reality is that we as corporations need to actually look at the interest of our investors as well. Just like Matilda's expecting returns from the many companies she's invest investing right now. So we're empowering growers uh, with training and digital technologies. We're bringing government agencies like Solidaridad, fascinating institution in the Netherlands who's helping us with farmers. We want to convert zero food left behind into good nutrition. Uh, improving the soil health and biodiversity, and then keep working to shorten the location, the distance and the price gap that people have versus good nutrition. So there are many algorithms today, many startups working to allow us to adapt pricing in our route to markets so we can provide better affordable offerings to those who cannot afford it today. So I'm just uh, giving you an example of how industry needs to work together to solve this. And, and all the exciting superpowers that companies have in distribution, production, supply chain, to make food much more accessible and affordable is certainly essential. Last but not least, to conclude, I think it is all about us, individuals, society, creating systemic change in food security also needs us to play our own purpose. Great purpose-led companies can only hire great purpose-led people. And I think that what we've done uh, during COVID-19, donating and distributing more than a million pounds of fruits around the world, uh, is only the, the evidence that when you embrace your organization, when you link with people in civil society, uh, you can drive systemic change. We launched our promise to the world with a little girl called Sophia, who wants to become the leader of this world and make a difference asking us adults, why is it that you have not done the things that you promised? So we need to give these young activists the space to talk. I think this is great, um, but I don't think it's enough. Uh, we have chosen adults to work with them and to learn with them. And that's why I'm very pleased to see also Josh in this call, a young man that has inspired me tremendously, that has been fighting against food security, insecurity, uh, as he also mm -hmm. runs a business and a foundation. He started this five year, when he was five years old, but I will not speak and steal his thunder. I'll put it back to you, uh, Sarah, so you can uh, pass it I over to him. I think we you. can just invite Josh to join us. Go ahead, Josh. Yes, 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 yes. So Josh, please join the conversation. Yes, I think of course. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Pierluigi. I appreciate that uh, kind introduction. Um, you were on a call previous together. That's why I originally met you. Um, but as you said, um, just to lead on right away is that youth and being able to have an empowerment between youth and adults um, and those who are typically in power um, is really, really important. And for a little bit of background on who I am, uh, my name is Joshua Williams. I'm from Miami, Florida. I think I'm the only one on the, I would say, you know, the Western Hemisphere right now. But um, Joshua's Heart is an organization that I started 15 years ago um, that is focused on empowering youth and providing direct food services to low-income families in different communities around the world. And so far, we've raised over $2 million in um, pure cash, um, and we've given over 3 million pounds of food, as well as over 200,000 toys. Um, and we focus, again, on youth volunteers. And because of that, we've had over 60,000 youth volunteers that we've worked with. And we see the importance of using kids and teaching them how to become change makers, teaching them the importance of philanthropy. So it creates a philanthropy base in their life. When they go on to the workforce, they have that um, those skills that being a change maker provides them. Um, and they're able to really see that for-profit industries can really combine and work with not-for-profits. And they really have, they can have the same goals. Um, after profit, you can really do whatever you want with it. Um, another thing that's interesting is that, that I was actually reading about is that in the past 20 years in America, volunteering has actually gone down um, in terms of the rate of volunteering in America. And in my opinion, a lot more kids my age are not volunteering in person, but rather doing a lot of advocacy work on social media. And this is where the new spotlight has really been, especially in the past you know, six to eight months, as you see in Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and in different industries, you see a lot of change going on online, a lot of fundraising going online. And the biggest movements are all online driven by youth. Um, and it's really important to recognize that change, um, that advocacy isn't only done in person anymore. It's done hugely on social media and the power that that gives people all across the world. Um, as long as you have access to the internet and a phone, which is growing every day, um, you have access to be able to make a change. Another thing that I want to talk about is that, and something that Mr. Pierluigi is very fond of, um, is I think the importance of for-profit companies, governments, and nonprofits of different sizes, all having the same goals, um, and that's how I think that we're able to solve the SDGs as soon as possible is to make sure that we all have the same goals and that we're all fighting the same battle um, and making sure that we're all on the same page and working together to make these changes. Um, and that's basically what I do. Um, I want to talk a little bit just about youth and how important it is to introduce um, early activism to youth at an early age and to show that they have the power to make a change, whether it's starting a business, um, launching a protest, um, creating a social media platform to make a change. It's really important that we encourage kids to make a change as early as possible. I started when I was four and a half. I'm 19 now. Um, and it's really cool. Even in business school, I go to New York University, um, Stern School of Business, and I'm learning, I'm studying finance there. But it's really interesting that um, a lot of our classes are actually, they've been changing the curriculum that it's centered around the SDGs actually, and it's centered around how companies can make a difference, um, investing in sustainable companies, and how this can actually create a positive impact in the world. So I think it's a really cool thing. In the next couple of years, we're going to see a big change. Uh, and one more thing is that, um, if we do teach these kids really early, when we're the business leaders and we're the people in power, um, our core being of who we are, um, it's going to be that change making philosophy is that ability to make a change. And that will be behind all the policies that we make the business decisions. So I think it's really important, again, to create that education early on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joshua. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really amazing to see really not just youth, uh, expressing their voices uh, that is amazing because you are all inspiring us but also youth doing things uh, that are very impactful so not only inspiring us but also making a huge impact in your own communities and inspiring other youth to become part of the big change so really thank you so much for sharing thank you so we flew from china to singapore and then to us and now we are getting back to asia for a bit and I'm gonna land in Indonesia and India because now I would love to introduce you to of our climate shapers. And I wanted to have them with us today because they both represent two different uh, communities, the Climate Reality Project from Al Gore and a community in Indonesia and uh, the Chef Manifesto and the Chef's Movements in India. And so please, Amanda and Radhika, join me on stage and let's start with Radhika, if you're Hi, ready. Yes. Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here today. And uh, I'm actually going to share my screen 
uh, however before that i would just like to say you know at one point of time um, chefs were just supposed to be people who would create menus can, can everyone see my screen yes sir okay so that's actually the end of my presentation let me just scroll up and now we are really really important actors in the food system um and that's exactly what i'm going to speak about today about how we are driving action within the food community in our immediate food community and globally as well um here are some of the things which we do one second oh man yeah so here are some of the things that we do um this is something which i really believe in now chefs and eating out now influences a lot of our food choices what we do when we are dining out um is something which we kind of mimic when we are at home as well and i feel like if we can kind of bring that change we are our menus and we are food habits and advocacy uh we can drive that change so oh my god i'm stuck again so our immediate community actually consists of our teams our diners our farmers our producers our restaurants and chefs around us and now even globally right like an entire network of chefs is now present globally which helps each other like the chef's manifesto here are some of the things which we do in our restaurant um we were actually one of the first people in new delhi to start bringing back stuff on our menu which existed in our country for the longest time like black chaka rice um, kodo millet finger millet etc these are some of the varieties we use in my kitchen um can you guys see this um it's just really indigenous varieties of rice and of different grains um however we do believe that we can't shove sustainability and uh, good food habits um by just calling it that so we kind of uh, go out of the out of our way to make sure that the food is appealing delicious uh, presentable and something that people would want to mimic when they go back home um some of the food again this is uh, just a fig uh, we call it the fig bowl um essentially it has an ancient grain um a sauce of their choice uh, usually it's uh, plant based but you can choose another protein as well the stuff you see on top the chips um they actually made with uh, the the zero waste they made with vegetable peels and um it's uh, just something which is uh delicious and we've um, managed to kind of monetize that as well so uh, zero waste and uh, monetizing is something i think as a business you have to do um another thing which we do very very consciously and sir i think you know this uh, about my restaurant and about me as well that uh, i am a huge advocate for uh, zero food waste only because it's always baffled me that there's so many people in this world going hungry and we have enough food yet we just keep throwing it <laughs> so um i actually ran a 45 day long campaign with the chef's manifesto um advocating for zero food waste where i shared recipes and tips and tricks um on how to actually do this at home um this is one of the garnishes which we use in our restaurant um also i also believe that there should be no secrets when it comes to these things so whenever we do something like that or whenever we are putting something like that on the menu we put it out on social media with the recipe because we want people to follow suit as well i feel like that's how you actually end up building a community with trust so this is um a garnish made out of spent coffee beans and stale bread it goes on one of our cocktails and here's the recipe if you like it um here's another one um this is a chutney made out of orange peels and uh, again something which is trashed i also feel like a big reason that this happens is because people don't know that it is edible in first place 
which is why advocacy plays a very, very important role. Education plays a really, really important role. And, um, but yeah, it's one person can only educate so much. We do have reach, but that's why community comes into play as well. Uh, this is one of the best sellers on my menu. It's something called skinny chipping and it's literally vegetable peels um, <laughs> with a sauce made with cauliflower stalks. So I think again, case in point, it's, not, it's just about perception. If you can package it nicely, sustainability is not that hard. Exactly what I was saying before, we create this deep impact when they eat the food without shoving sustainability into their faces and we just package it nicely and they want to take it back home with them. And um, hopefully that's what creates that change on a household level as well. Um, we work very, very closely with small scale vendors uh, and communities of farmers. Another thing which we do is we highlight all our vendors on our menu so that diners and people who come into the restaurant can see that and contact them directly. This adds additional income for the farmers as well and creates a communication channel with them. We feel like this is a really, really important thing. Again, no secrets here, complete transparency. Uh, this is something which we do on a six monthly basis. We haven't been able to go this year, but um, every six months, uh, my team and I go to the farm, uh, different farmers every time, and uh, we make a day out of it. I feel like it really, really puts people who come from different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds really, really aware of where their food is coming from. Also, it, gets, it helps them get back in touch with their roots and they come back with more knowledge than before and educate others as well. Yeah. So this is something which we did very consciously. Uh, when I started my first restaurant, I think we had only about like a 30% plant-based menu. By now, we are at a 70%. Um, we, again, take the unsuspected, uh, the unusual suspect as far as vegetables are concerned, and uh, we turn them into heroes and uh, package them nicely and make them more acceptable to the general public. So we use things like book pool, which comes into season for two weeks only in November, and we put it on our menu and have diners experience it as well again, promoting biodiversity. I really think that the role of chefs is crucial because chefs are making our life tastier and overall <laughs> can inspire community so much. So if you don't mind, Radhika, I would switch to Amanda because so <laughs> then we have just a few minutes uh, for the wrap up. And I thank you so much for sharing the recipes uh, and actually the way you are involving your community. Because then people hear about those topics, but needs also to apply that in their daily life. And they have to learn how to cook in their homes and how to choose the produce. And the things that you were saying are going to be reflected in their daily life as well. Absolutely. Really, thank you so much, Radhika. And yes. I'm inviting Amanda for this last voice. And then we have like five minutes for uh, last question for everyone. Hi, um, thank you, Sarah. Greetings from Jakarta, Indonesia. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to participate in this great event. Uh, Radhika, if you can uh, stop your screen sharing, I can uh, have mine up. Done. So this is like you again, I'm starting at the end, but let me start at the beginning. Um, you know, the message of uh, today's session is Asian collaborative innovation towards shared food system goals. And I'm bringing the experience and knowledge from three organizations, the uh, Climate Reality Project, the uh, 
Omar Niode Foundation that works to raise awareness in local agriculture, food, and culinary arts. And of course, the Food and Climate Shapers Digital Bootcamp, the uh, brainchild of SARA and Future Food Institute, and the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, we now know that we are all facing the uh, lots of crises, a number of crises, with at least three major crises, the pandemic, the hunger crisis, and the climate crisis as the mother of all crises. And the current food system, as we know, is often the, to blame as the driver of most of the crisis risk. And we definitely need to break the chain so that we could have an efficient and sustainable food system. Now imagine the opportunities, as you can see from the globe on the right hand side, the opportunities that we have across Asia for discovery, recovery, and prosperity. Imagine the biodiversity, the people, the science, the technology, and the innovation that already exist and could arise from our region. In addition to the sustainable development goals, I would suggest that we also look into the Paris Agreement that brings all nations into a common cause to, under, to undertake ambitious efforts to combat climate change and adapt to its effects. Article 12 of the Paris Agreement is called Action for Climate Empowerment, where we focus into education, training, public awareness, public access to information, public participation in decision-making and international cooperation. Now we can work on this uh, adjusted to the uh, efficient food system that we would like to have. And where are the points of collaborations uh, between the countries in the region? Um, there are so many actually. Uh, through abundance of opportunities in points of collaboration, I would like to suggest that we focus on herbs and spices, neglected and underutilized species, unique and popular ingredients such as stinky beans, if you can see the picture up in the middle. The Latin name is Parkia speciosa. It's very stinky, but delicious and nutritious. And perhaps it is also an acquired taste. I just would like to give an example that Indonesia alone has 17,500 islands, hundreds of ethnic groups, and then there are lots of uh, biological resources of food plants, more than 5,000. We have 100 types of carbohydrate sources, 100 types of nuts, and 250 types of vegetables, as well as 450 kinds of fruits and the identified traditional food and drink for sustainable gastronomy reach more than 35,000 types and they are still counting. Now, um, the next thing that we would like to know is of course, uh, what activities can we do? I would like to share what climate reality identify as the acts of leadership that we could do based on our, based on our interest, experience and resources. Some of the activities could be like what we are doing now. We could meet with uh, the media and then uh, meeting influencers and uh, participate in events as well as direct uh, public outreach. And I also learned from the uh, Food and Climate Shapers Digital Bootcamp, we need to be international and intergenerational. And I would like to add interdisciplinary as well. Now this evening we'll listen here in Indonesia, we'll listen to um, how youth um, in remote parts of Indonesia work with communities for sustainable uh, food system. Now in closing, I would like to suggest that we not only have to give voice to the voiceless in our food system, but also face to the faceless. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. And actually, I want to take your invitation uh, um, of uh, faces and voices. Uh, and I want to call everyone back on stage with the camera on. <laughs> and I want to ask you, from your point of view, from what you're doing, which are not only the voices you want to hear, but the elements of the food system you want to work with to achieve the SDGs from the community perspective, from the industry perspective, from the investors perspective, from the youth perspective, uh, really, 
this last round, one word. We need to achieve the SDGs and we know that Partnership for the Goal, the 17th SDGs is one of the most important one. We need to work together. So let's start from uh, Yi, if you're still there. And yeah. just let's do a quick round. One word. One, one word. word. Which are, yeah. <laughs> Who do you want to work with? Who do you need to achieve the SDGs from your perspective? Uh, Big question. Yeah, yeah. Institutions, Young. industry, yeah. chefs. Well, yeah, we have so many amazing people here. Um, maybe I would choose the word policy makers because this oh. is one area that, that hasn't been done very much here. Because this is not, you know, changing our food system is, is not just a responsibility of the producers or the consumers. It's also the responsibility of the policymakers. Very good. I collect the policymakers. Matilda. Yeah, uh, I love this question. I think the word that I'm going to choose is disruptors because I, I, I don't think there's a one specific role of the uh, uh, partners or stakeholders that needs to shape. It, it has to be disruptor across all different departments. Um, I don't think that uh, to be able to have a collaboration um, is going to be done in a movement overnight or it, it's going to be an evolutionary change. It has to be a revolutionary change. And everyone needs to break the rules, think outside of the box so that we can achieve the shared goals. Fantastic. I collect the disruptors as well. Pierluigi. I was going to use the same, but let me say innovators to bring biodiversity, uh, which is how we can enrich food to make it purpose driven, as we also work with startups, uh, growers, uh, agencies, um, and innovators to change the way we consume, the way we support this planet. Thank you. We love innovators. Joshua. Um, I would say investors, and I think Matilda's ahead of the curve here, to be honest, but um, I would say more people who are investing in, in these people who are really trying to change the world is really, really important to me. That's great. Thank you. Radhika? Chefs. Chefs. More <laughs> chefs. <laughs> we love chefs. <laughs> and Amanda? I, I will definitely go with enthusiastic youth that uh, we have to provide with uh, tools and rooms for them to act. Absolutely. So I thank you so much for this uh, incredible sharing. You were so inspiring and I'm sure that around the world, your voices are gonna be heard. Thank you so much for what are you doing in your daily life to better this planet. Thank you and you. Happy you. World Food Day! Happy World Happy Food Day! day. Happy I'm gonna Thank you. Mic Thank you, everybody. And landing to Japan. Bye. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Thank you for bringing your voice to the 24 Global Leader Conversation on Food Systems. The global conversation represents so much of what we hope the coming year will be about. Many people from different walks of life are coming together to engage in solutions-oriented dialogues and to address the root of what we want to achieve over the next 10 years. Our vision is to make this a people's summit, giving voice to citizens in every country of the world. With its activities spread over more than a year, the summit will bring together key players from the world of science, business, policy, healthcare, academia, as well as farmers, indigenous people, youth organizations, consumer groups, environmental activists, everyone, including you. I believe we can all find common ground in which we can grow a sustainable future together. We already know what we want the future to look like. We have the sustainable development goals to guide us and to support how we will measure our progress in achieving the future. Food is the instrument that touches all our lives, and through its lens, we can realize this vision of a better world. We must be bold. We must think and act differently. Transforming our food system is the most powerful action we can take to solve our biggest problems. Join us today. Join the Food System Summit. Join the conversation. 
Join the global dialogue we are launching today and over the course of the coming year. And together, I'm very confident we can build a just and resilient world where no one is left behind. Deputy Secretary General um, Amina Mohammed, so excited to have you here. Um, how has COVID-19 exposed the fragilities of our food systems? Well, thank you very much, uh, Marie Claire, and it's great to be with you and, and have this conversation. Uh, quite frankly, uh, what uh, what has happened is that really COVID has um, exacerbated um, the fragilities that were already there. Um, we already were seeing. Um, a number of people who were uh, already suffering from hunger and with COVID now the risk is even greater. But I think what the lockdown has done is that it has affected most young people in areas of, uh, in, in the rural areas where the informal sector um, is and, and so therefore um, that's a loss of livelihoods, that's a loss of income. Um, so it, it really does make it very difficult uh, to connect to the basic needs in one's life. Um, and, and, and therefore uh, nutrition, hunger, all um, uh, at risk and, and, and exacerbated. The disruption of the supply chains, which in, in turn impact the markets, um, that's also been across borders uh, a very big challenge uh, from COVID, um, again, exacerbating those food chains from production all the way uh, to, to market. In that disruption, uh, we also see food becoming more ex expensive and so therefore not as accessible um, even where we have it. I would say last but, but uh, certainly not least, um, the food loss and the waste uh, will increase if you cannot get to where the production is to get it to market. And uh, you know that that's a big discussion for us on the Food Systems Summit. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jessica Vega. I am indigenous uh, people from Mixteco people. I am uh, I am a current co-chair and the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus. Uh, my question is: uh, the food is so much about the everything in our lives, from culture to family. Tell me, how the food has uh, shaped your life? Thank you very much, Jessica. Well, um, we, we come from regions where um, food is very much a part of our family and community life. It's a place of gathering. It's a place um, even in the preparation of that food. And for me in my country, um, this, is, this is very important in different ways. First, I have a country that's very diverse. And so therefore the food from one part of the country to another part, um, is, uh, it differs in, in terms of um, in terms of local customs and religion and traditions, and, and it's very rich. Thank you for, for okay. sharing the, the big answer. It's, um, I mean, I think that uh, as we work across uh, countries and, and um, regions, um, it is remarkable how much uh, potential there is uh, for indigenous food. But maybe I could ask you a question, um, uh, both of you, um, how food influences your life. Um, you know, Marie Claire, you're from Switzerland, and Jessica, you're Mexico. So again, um, two different regions. Uh, it's important to talk about the food system because in this current pandemic is the one big issues. And then this, uh, as young indigenous person in the urban and rural context, I know that talking about the food is also talking about the land access to eat, agriculture, and the many forms production for food but also it's um, fair consumes talk about the effects of the climate change gender issues also talk about the identity because the food is part of the cultural identity and this talking about the family and community how can uh, sharing the traditional knowledge and how this impact in the life it's not only the passion for food system, it's also the urgency to talk about the human rights and the food is the one of them. The food is the really impact in my life because they give me my identity. My life story is part of my passion, but also my collective process. I know with that what happened in my territory and the other territories of the seven regions where there are indigenous people and not only problems become also be part of the solution or the traditional way eating also high nutrients 
and can even medicinal. So we urgent the world to respect and promote them for the more sustainable and healthy phone system. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Hi. Nice to meet you, everyone. Okay. Hi. This Japanese session is Japanese only. So, for English translate, please click the link in the chat. Thank you. So, there are Japan session of all high key such data that I like to my mask. Yes, I'm your school. I'm going to ask. 最初に今回のあのイベントの取り組みの概要を簡単にご説明させていただければと思います。えっと、スクリーン映してもらっていいですかね。はい、ありがとうございます。えー、タイトルにフードシステムズ入っておりますが、えー、国連ではフードシステムの変革が SDGs の達成に向けて非常に重要であるという考えのもと、来年ですね、フードシステムサミット2021を開催するようになっております。今回のイベントは、それに向けての動き出し、最初の取り組みということで、世界中の人々をつなぎ、リレー形式でトークディスカッションをしていく、そういったイベントになります。はい、私、今回のモデレーターを務めさせていただきます。フューチャーフードジャパン、そして東京建物の澤と申します。よろしくお願いいたします。フューチャーフードジャパンは東京建物グループとフューチャーフードインスティートが連携し、日本において食に起因する社会課題の解決に向けて取り組んでいる、そういった活動になります。フューチャーフードジャパンはですね、東京駅前の京橋にある東京フードラボを拠点に活動しておりまして、1階が植物工場、2階がシェアキッチンになっております。今回はこのフードラボの2階のキッチンから放送をさせていただいております。一部の登壇者の方にはオンラインでの参加をお願いしております。続いて今回の登壇者のご説明になります。今回この4名の方に登壇していただくことになっております。前半はそれぞれの方から各自の取り組みについてご紹介いただきまして、残りの時間で全員参加してのトークセッション、そちらの方を予定しておりますのでよろしくお願いします。それでは早速始めたいと思いますのでよろしくお願いします。一番最初は農林水産省の米田さんになりますのでよろしくお願いします。はい、皆さんランチタイム終わりの皆さんこんにちは。えー、農林水産省の米田律子と申します。えっ、ー、とー。多分この後の皆さんがいろいろ面白い取り組みをお話されると思うんで、あの、私からはですね、皆さんの取り組みのご紹介を兼ねて、触りのとこだけちょっと簡単に、あの、サステナビリティって何だろうっていうところでお話をさせていただければと思います。よろしくお願いします。えっ、ー、と、簡単にまず自己紹介。さっき名前しか、あの、紹介していただけなかったので、ここでちょっとだけ。あの自己紹介です、えっと、写真2つ偉そうなの載ってますけどもあの農林水産省で国際関係担当していろいろ会議に出てます、まあ、それどう言い換えるとですね単に出張回数は多いですなのでいろいろあの外国で見聞きしたことなんかもあの交えながらお話しさせていただければと思いますでまずその上に私もこのなんだろうあのロゴに SDGs サステナブルデベロップメントゴールズの,あのロゴ入れさせてもらってるんですけどそもそもじゃサステナビリティは何なんですかとで初め聞いた時にあのなんだろうサステナビリティって何ですかって言ってそれで説明してくださいって言ったら多分みんな止まると思うんですねで私も結構止まった時期があっていろいろいろんな人の話聞いたりいろいろ勉強したりして、まあ、こういうことかなっていうのが3つあってでそれってこ,のここにある3つ、経済と社会と環境とそれぞれ要素があってでこれが3つバランス取れてなかったらあんまりうまくないんじゃないかあの下にウェルバランスって書いてますけど結局、どれか1つが、ね、あのなんか突出しちゃうと極端な話になっちゃってそれでなんかうまくいかないなんか変な話になっちゃうなっていうのは最近すごく思うようになりました。経済っっててなんだろうっていうといとまず
例えば農業の話で言えば、まあ、あの農家さんが物作ってもそれでご飯が食べていけなかったら意味ないでしょっていう話が一つで社会っていうのは、まあ、みんながより良い暮らしでこの後ろの,あの絵はこれお祭り地元のお祭りですあのなんていうのかなコミュニティがちゃんとうまく待ってないと意味ないよねっていうお話で3つ目はその環境ここにあの鳥の絵がありますけど、まあ、まさにあれですね、差し上げていると結構環境の側面って思い浮かぶ人多いと思うんですけど、まあ、地球の資源って別に使い放題じゃないんですよねと、まあ、このお話三大話があってでこれがそれぞれなんか綺麗にこにうまく調和してないとダメなんじゃないでよくよくあのその後調べてみたら確かにこれズバリでその SDGs のコンセプト3つっていうところであの経済社会環境これ順番に文句言う人いるんですけどあのこの順番で並んでます。経済社会環境で並んでます。で、これがやっぱり鍵だなと思っていて。で、あの、この他にも多分いろんな、いろんな価値ってあると思うんですよね。例えば個人の幸せとか技術もそうだし、まあ、そのものを丸々、もろもろ、いろいろそのまとめて、で、サステナビリティなんだっていうのが最近私が、あの、至った結論です。で、よく考えてみると、SDGs って17ゴールあるんですよね。で、始めた時になんで17あるのと思ったんですけど、これがうまくできててでそれぞれ全部調和して一体で SDGs サステナビリティなんだっていうああなるほどみんなよく考えたなすごいなっていうあのそういう感じになってます。でじゃあこのサステナビリティって観点から日本の農業ってちょっと見てみたらどういうことが言えるんだろうかっていうのを少しご紹介させていただきます。あのここの写真に出させていただいているのはですねあの世界農業遺産あの国連食料農業機関で FAO ってローマにある機関なんですけどそこであの認められている世界に伝えて守り伝えていきたい農業地域伝統もあるしちゃんと人の暮らしも成り立っているし素晴らしい取り組みになってますっていうそういう地域なんですけどあの大分県の群馬高田っていうところの,あの田んぼの風景です、まあ、割とそんなに違和感ないと思うんですよね皆さん見てて。でこれ何が素晴らしいかっていうとこれ田んぼなんで人が手を加えてるんですよねであの自然ってみんな言うんですけどこれって天然の自然じゃないっていうのはパッと見多分お分かりだと思うんですけどねそれで、あのー、人が自然と共にあって農業をやっててうまく調和してるっていうのはこれすごいいい絵だなと思ってで実はこれ Zoom、あのー、の,のバーチャル背景です下のリンクからあのクリックしてダウンロードフリーでできますので皆さんアクセスしてください。であのこれをなぜ、まあ、そのすごいかっていうところでねもう一つ言うとあの人間が農業をやるからだから自然がうまくあの回ってるってさっきあのちょっとお話しさせていただいたところなんですけど例えば田んぼ一つ見ても田んぼに水張ってるからカエルがいるとかですねでそういう世界の話っていうのがあの日本では普通にあるとでそれがすごくいいところなんじゃないかなと私最近というか、まあ、本当に強く思ってます。でこれってじゃあなんかすごく世界共通の普遍的なものなのって言ったら必ずしもっていうかもう全然そうじゃないですよね。で考え方は諸外国とは少し違う点点点かもって書いてるんですけど違いますかなり違います。であの自然って言った時にあの私結構ヨーロッパに出張することが多いんですけどあのヨーロッパの感覚で言うともう手つかずの自然が素晴らしいっていう人ってすごくいっぱいいて自然っていうと普通そっちを指すことが多いんですよね。そうするとさっきの,その田んぼとかこれも一つあの世界農業遺産の,あの徳島の,あの山にこうみんなであの集落が住んでる集落がこの農業に移されてるとこなんですけどあのこういうものを自然って言わないよっていう人も結構いてでなんで自然って言わないかっていうと本当にその手つかずの大自然切り倒して切り開いてこうやってるんでしょってそういう感覚なんですよねそうするとあの農業って環境に悪いじゃんっていうなんかそういう発想になっていてでそ,うそれってそれって何か違わないかと私すごく思うんですよね。でここでそのパッと見全く皆さん違和感ないと思うんですけどあの二次的自然ってあの一般的にセカンダリーネイチャーとか言うんですけどあの人が自然と共にあって調和していってそれで丸くあのうまくつながってそれであの持続的にやっているっていうそういうその価値観っていうのはあの私今フードシステムをいろいろなんだろうあの課題抱えてるっていうあの話先ほどモデレーター感もありましたけど解決策の一つとして日本でとどめとくにものすごいもったいないと思ってますでこういうその考え方っていうのはどんどんそのあの言っていかなきゃいけないんじゃないかなと思って最近自分でも言うようには努力してるんですけど
、まあ、なかなかまだあの1人ではうまくいかない農水省だけで頑張ってもうまくいかないなのであの今日あの見ていただいている方々それからあのここでオーガナイズしていただいている方々のお力も借りながらこれをトレンドにしていきたいなと思っています。で次です、えー、とちょっと国連食料システムサミットについて触れさせていただきますね。であの国連食料システムサミットあの、まだ決まってない話も多いんですけど、とにかくまず決まってるのが、来年の9月にニューヨークでやると、でかなり大規模なものになりそうだとっていうところまで決まってます。で、あとその5つポイントがあって、まあ、こういうことをトピックにして取り上げていきましょうっていうのがあのもう公表されてるんですけど、まずはあれですね、あの人々に安全で栄養のある食料を、まあ、要はあのまだまだ飢餓に苦しんでる人って世界で11人。世界人口で11人に1人ぐらいいてで実際カロリー足りててもあの栄養がバランスがむちゃくちゃ悪くてそれで体の調子悪くなってる人とかも山ほどいるんで、まあ、そこの課題どうするかっていうのがまず1つそれから2つはその持続可能な消費パターンで最近あのエシカル消費とかいうあの言葉もなかなか割とあのトレンドになってきてますけれどもあの大量生産大量消費本当にそれでいいのっていうそういう考え。で3つ目は自然にポジティブな生産あの山,切り山から木切り倒してそれで作ってそのままほったらかして終わりってそういうことはやめましょう使い放題じゃありませんで4つ目が所得の向上と雇用創出でこれはあのやっぱり食べていかなければ意味がないんですよとこれもあのさっきのバランス論の中で1つトピックとしてあったと思いますで最後が脆弱性やショックへの大量強化って結構かたくかりないんですけど要はその例えばコロナがありましたそれから災害が起きてますじゃあどうやって試しますか、まあ、そういうお話なんです。で、まあ、少しその宣伝をさせていただいたところでちょっと私の経験から少しおまけをさせていただきます。あのこれちょっとねあの私よく思う話なんですけど出張行ってそれであのランチを外で食べることってもついてあるんですけど。だいたいいくらぐらいかかるかって一回そのお店のメニュー見て、まあ、体感なんですけどちょっとあの記録してみたことがあるんですよね。日本でだいたいうちの近所のあの定食屋さん行ったら750円で焼き鳥定食食べれます。まあそんなにあの贅沢しなければまあそんな感じかな東京だとそんな感じかなって言うんですけどこれがそのプラス行くとですねパリ行くと最低でも2000円から3000円すると。まあ、テイクアウトじゃなくてね、あのちゃんとあの普通に席に座ってテーブルで食べたらそれぐらいして、そこにあの食後のコーヒーなんか頼んだらもうさらに500円とか600円とかそういう世界になってる。で、一番高いのはこのスイス、ジュネーブだったんですけど、あのもう最低3000円から、でもう下手したら本当に4000、5000円ランチだけでかかっちゃう。これ,これ別に贅沢してるわけじゃなくて、本当に普通に食べてそんな感じになっちゃうと。でこの差って一体どこから来るんだろうなっていうのをちょっと考えてみたいなと思ってるんですよね。で、あのー、これってさっきからフードシステム、フードシステムって言ってるんですけど、フードシステムって何ですかって言われたら、まあまあ、要は言ってみりゃ、あのー、食とか、あのー、食べ物にまつわるあれやこれや全部ってことなんで、結局、農家さんがその生産してから、それからこここういうそのレストランに来るまで全部、全部息き通過して、まあ、全部ひっくるめてフードシステムってことだと思うんで。そしたらその中でこの750円とそれと2000円3000円と最低3000円のこの違いっていうのは何で起きてるんだろうかっていうのはちょっと私あの皆さんと一緒に一度機会があれば考えてみたいなと思ってます。あのー、本当にこれ日本人そう思うんですけど東京ほどって日本ほどですねあの職場とかでいろんなものが安く食べれるってないなと思って。でこういうそのところこういうその我々がなぜそういうその恵まれた状況にいるか、あ、恵まれたって私言っちゃってますけど、恵まれた状況にいるかっていうのは本当にちょっと一回皆さんでフードシステムを考える時のお題の一つに加えていただきたいなと思います。あのこの後あの皆さんのあの取り組みの立派なあの事例がいろいろご紹介されますので、とりあえず私はこれぐらいこれぐらいでしたあのお貸しいただきます。ありがとうございます。金子さんありがとうございました。それでは続きまして、ユニドのフェルドさんの方からあのプレゼンをしていただきますので、フェルドさん、よろしくお願いします。よろしくお願いします。ちょっと待ってください。あの今あの、スライドアップしますんで。
見えますかスライド見えますか大丈夫ですかありがとうございます。すいません、えーと。ご紹介いただいてありがとうございます。ユニードのゲレゲンです。よろしくお願いいたします。あのー、ちょっとユニードの簡単なあの紹介から始めたいと思いますけれども、あれ,れ動いてないんですよね。オッケーです。オッケーです。すみません。はい。あのユニードのちょっと簡単なあの紹介したいと思いますので、あのユニードは途上国で産業または工業の開発を支援している国連の機関です。あの1966年に設立して、1981年に独立した専門機関になりました。あの本部はウィーンにありまして、あの全世界に56ぐらいの事務所があります。事務局長はリー・ヨングです。ここの,写あの下の,あの写真にありますの,の,あの方ですので、全体のユニードであの3000ぐらいのスタッフが仕事をしています。あのウィーンの,あの国連の本部の一つなんですけど、あのユニード以外にですね、IAEA とか UNODC あのという他の,あの国連機構も入っています。でユニードの,あの仕事の話なんですけどあの3つの柱がメインになりますんであので1位は全ての人々が豊かになることこの,テーマになこのテーマの中にアグリインダストリーも入っていますで経済競争力を高めることが2番目で3番目は環境を守ることこれは全部あの産業あの途上国の産業と一緒にあの仕事をし,てしながらあのやっている仕事です。こちらはユニード東京の紹介なんですけれどもあの基本的に日本の民間企業から途上国へ FDI へとテクノロジートランスファー、まあ、海外投資と技術移転を支援しています。一番メインな仕事はビジネスマッチングですので、アグリフードはどんな途上国でも大事なセクターですので、あのそちら、まあ、アグリフードに関してもあのこういうビジネスマッチングはあのよくやります。途上国にとって日本のアグリフードに関する技術、ノウハウ、研究開発の経験が大事です。で今日は私あの、参加しているのはこの,あの上右上にあるあの国連大学のビルの,あの8階からです。こちらにユニードのオフィスは入っています。先ほどテクノロジートランスファーの技術移転の話しましたんですけれども、ここであの我々の仕事の中で一つの,あの,、えー、とあのメインなやってるあの仕事を話したいと思いますので、ステップというあの、えー、ユニードの途上国のニーズをターゲットしている持続可能な技術プロモーションのプラットフォームがあります。このプラットフォームはあのユニードの東京のウェブサイトの中にあります。今現在、環境技術とアグリビジネスまたは健康管理な技術、日本の100社以上の技術が入っています。アグリビジネスに関しては36のテクノロジーが入っています。あの興味ある方はあのこのウェブサイトあのこのリンクでこのウェブサイト、あとは、まあ、あのオンラインブローシュもありますので、そちらも見えます。今からいくつくアグリフードの技術を紹介したいと思います。こちらは野菜とフルーツをおいしく作る技術です。メビオーシャのイメックフィルムテクノロジーは薄い膜1枚使って、少ない水できれいでおいしいお商品ができます。この技術は例えば今ドバイでも使われてますがあの途上国で特に水ないあのあの途上国の国ではあのビジネスチャンスを探してますまたは2019年にイタリアのユニード事務所とフューチャーフードインスティテュートも支援したコンテストで賞を取りましたあのこれに関して特にあの今あの今日も参加していると思いますけれどもあのフューチャーフードインスティテュートのサラさんとユニードのイタリア事務所のダイナさんにあの感謝をしています。こちらはですね、南アフリカでフレッシュジュースメーカー、サーフルーツ社のプラントで使われている前川製作場のクーリング技術を使ったスライドですけれども、まあ、そのクーリング技術はここで見えないんですけれども、あのクーリング技術を使って
あのえー、ソイフルーツ社が省エネと同時に商品のクオリティもアップしました。だから、まあ、我々の仕事ではあのそのフードに関して直接の技術ではなくて、まあ、こういうクーリングとか、まあ、あのそのあのマニファクチャリングなプロダクションの環境をです、ね、あのよくあのあの作る技術も使ってあのそのアグリフードのビジネスを支援しています。でこちらは鳥取リソースリサイクリング社のポールスアルファブランドの技術です。この技術の特徴はリサイクルグラスバトルを使ったチップを土に埋めて少ない水で野菜を育てることができます。例えばモロッコで 50% 水を減らしてトマトを 20% 多く使っています。作っています。ごめんなさい。これから技術だけでなく、途上国でアグリビジネスをし,している企業を紹介します。日本のファーリースト社がウガンダで投資して、ドライフルーツをプロセスして、日本に輸出しています。現在、ウガンダでファームさんも含めて150人が働いています。例えば、こちらの右下の写真はオーガニックドライマンゴーです。日本でも人気と聞いています。最後になりますが、こちらもアフリカのタンザニアで投資したテルヌマカツイチ商店社です。現地の会社はマトボルワと言います。ローカルなファーマーさんたちと働いて、タンザニアで干し芋を作って日本に輸出しています。このような日本の技術とノウハウを使って、途上国でビジネスを作れば、現地で若者と女性の仕事が増えます。同時に日本のアグリフードセクターにビジネスチャンスが生まれて、消費者にも美味しいものが届きます。そして、持続可能な経済目標に貢献できると思います。簡単になりましたか私から以上ですので、後ほどあのディスカッションに参加したいと思います。ありがとうございました。はい、ルーさん、ありがとうございました。えー続きましてはヒグマクシスの田中さんからのプレゼンになります。田中さんよろしくお願いします。はい、よろしくお願いします。じゃあ画面共有しますね。これ今どっちになってますか。プレゼンターモードですかね。プレゼンターモードです、ね。そうですね。はい。じゃあじゃあこっちでいいですね。あ、あ今プレゼンターモードになってます。あな,なっちゃった。はい、すみません。じゃあ、こっちか。じゃあ、こっちですね。はい。はい、えー、よろしくお願いします。じゃあ、あのクイックに、えー、シグマクシスの田中と申します。で、今、あのーん、こっちになっちゃった。ちょっと待ってくださいね。ラっぽいです。うん。変わったかなはい、じゃあ、okay. こちらでいきます。はいえーとまあ、スマートキッチンサミットジャパンというものを3年前からやっておりまして、その日本における、まあ、食の,そのエコシステム作りなんかをいろんな企業の方々とやってます。で、えー、と今年の7月にですね、フードテック革命という書籍を、えー、出しまして、まあ、このような形で、どんどんこの食の進化に関心のある皆さんとつながっていくと、こんなことやってます。で、えっと、本業はですね、その、まあ、企業の方々と一緒にその事業開発、まあ、そういったところを伴走したりしてるんですが、えっと、実は真ん中にある1年間に1回のキッチンサミットですとか、あとコミュニティ作り、あと先ほどの本にあるような情報発信などをしていまして、まあ、ここにあの、皆さんとはですね、実はその、いろんな形でつながっていると。まあ、そんなことをやっていますでスマートキッチンサミット自体は、まあ、3年間で、まあ、少しずつ増えてきていて去年は500名ぐらい参加するまで、あのー、なりましたでやっぱりこの食のテーマを扱っていてその非常にこうすごいなと思うのはやはりこうみんなが笑顔になるということここはあの真ん中サラとかも映っていますけれどもこういう形でこう今動いてますでこの特徴はですね非常にあの参加者の方々が多様ということでその家電メーカー
とか、あと食品メーカー、あと流通、小売、あと外食、投資家、あと本当に製造業の方とかですね、いろんな人たちがその食の,そのフードテック、フードイノベーションに関心を持っていると。で実はあの去年のキッチンサミットですね、あの今あの説明あの、プレゼンまさにしたあのヨザさんもこう実は登壇していただいて、私、こんなに日本語が流暢だというのはすみません、当時知らなくてですね、あの今ちょっとびっくりしております。あのサラもあの登壇していると、こんな形でやってます。で今年あのキッチンサミット、12月の17から19であのやりますので、またあのそんなところで会えたらなと思います。で少しあのトレンドのところをお話をあと数分でしたいと思うんですけれども、今、この食周りの投資ですね、あのフードクッキングテックという言い方してますが、すごい投資があの10年ぐらいから伸びてまして、このいわゆる生産から買い物、あとはあのデリバリー、あとはその調理、あとはそのパーソナライズレシピとかですね、そういったところに至るまで非常に投資が進んでいるんですが、実はその裏でちょうど2015年頃からですね、こうあのフードかけるテクノロジー、フードをかけるサイエンスのカンファレンスが竹の子のように増えてきている中で、もうますますこの盛り上がってきているとで。今回のテーマにも関わるんですが、じゃあなんでそんなにこのフードテック、フードイノベーションが叫ばれ,、ね、叫ばれているのかということなんですけれども、ここがあの実はサステナビリティのところともあの非常に関わるんですが、やっぱりその社会課題と食、食が社会課題を生み出しているということと、あとやっぱりもっと人が幸せになっていきたい。これあのサステナビリティを追いすぎると人が不幸せになるとかそういうことではなくてやっぱりこう人も地球も共存しながらより幸せになっていくそんなところがその大きなドライバーになっています。でこれあの去年ですねそのアメリカの方で発表されたあのチャートでしてこれ知ってる方もいらっしゃるかもしれませんが今あの食が実はあのものすごいネットマイナスの産業になっているんじゃないかというような課題提起がされてました。これ1000兆円の点取りリオンですね。1000兆円のその価値がある一方で、裏でその健康被害による、まあ、食べ過ぎによる健康被害のコストですとか、あとあの、いわゆるその CO2 の排出ですとか、あとあのフードロスとかですね。やっぱりそのこのままだともうその持たないよと。で、これを解決するためにみんなで手を取り合おうという。これ左側の価値を生み出している人と、右の,そのコストをしている人たちが、実は分かれているんですよね。そういったようなことで、その今、食と社会課題というものをまあ結びつけて、解決していかないといけないというようなことが一つあります。ただですね、このマイナスばっかりではないんですよね、食って。やっぱりその食って、これまであの人を健康にして平均寿命を伸ばしてきました。で、で、これからですね、実はあの食が持つもっと多様な価値を見ようよというような実は声がありまして、そのもう時短もいいけど、もっと時間使いたいとか、最近だとビーガンとかフレキシタリアンとか、そういった食べ物自体が生き様を表すとか、あと孤食を避ける、孤独を避けるために食を使えないかとか、こういうロングテールなニーズが出てきていてですね、それがその右側のニーズだとか状態を可視化するためにテクノロジーとかですね、汎用化されたサイエンスというものを活用しようと。そんな動きが出てきてきいますこれ実際に我々昨年ですねアメリカと日本とイタリアで調査をして人が食にどんな価値を持ってるのっていうような質問をしたところ、まあ、当然この健康でいたいとかそういったところは多いんですけども実は生きがいを感じたいとか誰かのために役立ちたいとか自己表現したいとか周りとつながりたいとかそういった声が実は結構上がっているんですね。でやっぱりここういういのを見た時になんかこの社会課題という食ということを解きつつもでも食が持っている可能性をアンロックすることでその生活者一人一人が主体的に食の課題に取り組むことができるなのでこれをぐるぐる回していくということがすごい重要かなと思ってますしあとこのコロナの影響で実はそのバリューチェーンがリセットされてこれサラなんかがよく言ってますけれども実は解けなかった課題が解けるようになってきた解かないといけなくなってきたあとその家中の消費とかが増えることによってより食の価値を考えるようになってきたそういう中で我々が見ているのはこの昨年まではよし取り組もう取り組まないといけない取り組めばいいことが起きるということからもう今絶対やらないといけないということでこの食の進化が進んでいるというのが今我々が見ている世界です、まあ、そのような形で取り組みをしていますので今日は何か有意義な議論できればなというふうに思っておりますよろしくお願いしますはいありがとうございましたえー、続きまして、日本農業の大西さんからプレゼンをしていただきます。大西さん、よろしくお願いします
えー、皆さんこんにちは。日本農業株式会社の大西です。えっと簡単に先に自己紹介をさせていただきますと、えっと私は学生時代二十歳の時に、えっと、畑を耕すところから農業ベンチャーで起業しました。で今は京都府南丹市と大阪府美濃市というところで農業をしています。でプライベートではですね、2歳と4歳の母でもあります。でまあそんなあの私が。二十歳の時、学生時代になぜ農業で起業したのかということなんですけど、あの、私1990年生まれでして、で、本当にその、まあ、何不自由なく、あの、安い、美味しいは当たり前の豊かな日本で育ってきた中で、2050年問題という問題が、あの、結構いろんな、あの、ところで言われるようになりました。2050年というと、私自身はまだ50代。で子供なんかは本当にまだ私と同じぐらいの年代になるんですけどその時世界の人口は100億人を超えていて食料戦争も起こるかもしれないぐらいあの食が大変だと。でかたや日本はあの、まあ、少子高齢化が起きてですね地方に担い手がいないという現状を知ってで本当にこのままの経済の在り方で大丈夫なのかというのがあって、えー、いろんなボランティア活動に参加していたんですけれども。その中であの農業ボランティアに仲間と一緒に行ったことがきっかけで,で農業であれば文化が残ったり地方が創生されたり本当にその新しい経済の発展だけじゃない価値が生み出されるんじゃないかなと思いまして農業に飛び込みましたでこちらの写真があの私が耕している南丹市の補助の写真なんですけれども、まあ、本当に里山ですただもう私農業を始めて10年になるんですがまあ、本当いろんな課題にぶち当たりましたでなぜ農業者が増えないのかということもすごく肌で実感するようになりましたでその中で、まあ、農家自身がやっぱり食べていけないで今の経済システムの中であの、まあ、農業では食べ,食べていけないということがあの分かりましたでもですねあの本当にその日本の里山にはたくさんの可能性を秘めていると思っていまして、まあ、今 SDGs という目標も、まあ、世界の中で達成しようというふうにあの向かっていると思うんですけど、まあ、その中の根幹にあるものっていうのは自然の資本だと思っていますで私も農業をしていてあの本当に日本の里山の中にはそこにはその農業のサイクルに合わせて、まあ、カエルだったりトンボだったり本当にいろんなあの生物多様性があるなと思ってますで。その中でサステナブルな農業、できるだけ自然と向き合いながらする農業っていうのは、土壌の中にもたくさんの微生物がいます。やっぱそういったあの畑、まあ、地球は本当に土で覆われていると思うので、そこにやっぱ生物多様性を生み出すことができるのが農業だなと感じてます。ただ、この農業に、若い人を従事させるには今の仕組みだけじゃ難しいなと思いましたでその中で私の取り組みを始めたのが独自産業です独自産業っていうのは何かというと一次産業の生産だけではなくて加工そして販売までを担うものです農家は今や消費者に直接出口を持つ時代だと思ってますで具体的に私は野菜を作って今は美味しさからブランディングができるスープだったり将来的に野菜は医療への可能性もあると思っていますので野菜だけを絞ったコールドプレスジュースであったりで今回あのコロナも経験してですね飲食店で使うはずだった大根もたくさん余ってしまったんですけれども,、まあ、もうその時には6次産業を始めていたので野菜アイスに全て転換してロスをなくした。まあ、この6次産業っていうのは、ここに農家が出口を持つことで、農家が食べていけるモデルを作ることができる。プラス、自分たちで出口を持つことで、そうやってあの作ったものをあのロスなく、えー、使うことができるなと感じてます。でもう一つ、6次産業の魅力というのは、この SDGs を達成するために、私はこの持続力と想像力と環境力、この3つの力が必要だと思っていまして、独自産業にはその力が詰まっています。持続力っていうところなんですけれども、まあ、こういったコロナが起きても、必ず食べていけるモデルっていうのは作っていかないといけないと思います
、その中でいつまでも農業ができる環境を残すサステナブルな農業をするということは持続力につながりますでもこの経済社会の中で我慢我慢を強いるようなものではなかなか難しいと思いますでやっぱりその消費者野菜を食べてもらう人がいるのでそこにはあスープおいしそうだなとかコールドプレスジュースで健康になりたいなとか野菜で創造性を持ってワクワクして未来を感じるということが必要だと思っていてそれが野菜を加工することによって生み出せると思っていますそして農業をするときにサステナブルを考えるだけではなくてそこには、まあ、例えばあの環境に優しいフローンを出さない冷凍技術であったりあと輸送するときもできるだけ地産地消でエネルギーをできるだけ削減していくような流通の,あの環境技術も必要になってくると思っています。私の独自産業の具体的な取り組みの紹介なんですけれども、今はまあ加工でいろんなものを作っていて、出口、3時の出口として、えっと、スープ店を経営しています。今はまだあの大阪と京都と農地のあるところに2店舗なんですけれども、まあ、そこではではすね、普通のちょっと出口と違うのが私たちは農家なので四季折々できる野菜が違うので、まあ、そのスープにはその時できる野菜が入っていますこの写真はの味噌チャウダーなんですけれども今はマコモダケとかあと追熟したかぼちゃとか旬のものが入っていてそれがだんだん大根とか株が取れ出すようになるとそれが入って夏は夏野菜が入っていますであとはあの、まあ、ご飯とかあのパンも作ってるんですけどまあ、それのパンは注文が入ったらあの冷凍を解凍してというような形で,でご飯も玄米酵素ご飯を提供することによって毎日ロスが出ないロスゼロを目指したあの飲食店を経営していますで今は2店舗なんですけれどもこの脳の入り口を作りながら出口を作るということが6次産業では非常に重要だと思っていまして店舗を増やしながら今工作されてない工作放棄地であったり新しく収納者を増やしたりということでどんどん畑を耕していこうということで取り組んでいますでこちらは農家直営だからこそできることなんですけれども店舗が増えることだけがあの弊社のやっている理念ではないので店舗が増えれば増えるほど農家が増えるという取り組みをやっています今は専業農家だけではなくてこういうコロナもあってリモートワークをしながら半分都会で稼ぎながら、半分自分たちの食を生み出していくような反応反的な関わりであったり、福祉と連携した農業であったり、たくさんのその農と関わるやり方っていうのが、この少子高齢化をもう迎えている日本では必要だと思っていまして、担当スープに関わる従業員の方であったり、その家族の方であったり、で、またお客さんでもいいと思いますし、まあ、そういう方々が農家の大変な、まあ、種まきだったり、玉ねぎなんかは1回, 1回にたくさん収穫するのでその時にひげを切ったりとかそういう作業であの農業都会から農村に逆で稼ぎするというモデルもやっていますでちょっと最後にですね、まあ、一,一次産業ベンチャーがこのような独自産業をして収納者を増やして新しい価値を創出していくということはとてもできませんただ SDGs の17番目にあるいろんな方とパートナーシップを組みながら達成していくことはできると思っていますしかも少子高齢化が一番に来ているのは日本です今回コロナのようなパンデミックも起きてもう都心だけでは密が起きすぎてどんどん地方に分散する必要性も出てきていると思うのでそれはチャンスだと捉えてこれから経済社会環境のバランスの取れたあり方を農業から発信できるのではないかと思っています今まではリッチだけが豊かさだったのがこういった自然が残る自然と一緒にあの美味しい野菜を育てて食べていくウェルスの新しい価値の創出というのがこの日本の農業からはできるのではないかそういった食料システムを日本からまた発信していくことも世界の SDGs の達成のうちの一つの,あのゴールになるのではないのかなと思っています。以上で私のプレゼンは終わりますありがとうございましたはい、ありがとうございました
、えー、ここからはですね、えー、と全員の方に参加いただきまして、えー、とフリーディスカッションという形で進めていきたいと思いますので、田中さん、フェルダさん、お願いいたします。お願いいしますはいちょっと時間も限られるので、あ,のあまりあの長いフリーのトークはできないんですけども、まあ、今回あの、いろんな切り口で皆さんお話しいただけましたけども、あのくしくも最初と最後は結構近しいお話だったかなと思ってまして、その日本ならではの,そのやり方、あの最初、ニュルズさんが自然観のお話があったと思いますけども、こう日本ならではの,この自然の感覚、あるいは食文化の感覚の中で、日本からだから発信できる。食の進化を推し進めることができるということも、あの SDG の達成にはつながっていくんじゃないかみたいな、そういった発言が最初と最後に今日だったかなと思ってまして、ちょっとそういった意味でこう、日本がじゃあ今後、この持続可能な社会の実現、あるいは新しいフードシステムを作っていく上で、こう何をじゃあ,あのやっていくべきなのか、どこから手をつけていくべきなのかというところで、いろんな切り口はあるとは思うんですけども、こうじゃあまずその、今井さんに振っちゃいますけど、野、は、水、い、<笑>さんの観点からでいうと、今後、日本がこういった取り組みをより進めていく、はい、あるいはいろんな方に参加いただくためには、どういったことをやっていくべきというふうに今思われてますかね、えっと、まずですね、あの私の方には、今、みんなが当たり前だと思っていることだったと思うんですよね、さっきの,あの魚の話であっても、その農業で、あの大西さんがおっしゃった。あの田んぼにカエルがいる、トンボがいる、それから微生物がどのようにいっぱいいる、それを当たり前だと思わないようにあの広めていこうだと思ってるんですよね。これって別に普通じゃないんじゃないもしかしてすごいことじゃないかと、そこは多分農水省の選定が全然足りてないんだと私は反省してて、今、お前も反省するとなきゃいけないんですけどあの、そういうところからまずは始めて、それで賛同していただける人、気づいてくれる人を増やしていくって、まあ、そこからじゃないかなと思ってます。なるほどそういった意味ではあのスマートキッチンサミットジャパンとかでそういろんな方の,あのつながりを作っていく中でいろんな食の気づきだとか、えー、日本において食の進化を進めるにあたってどういうことをやっていくべきなのかっていうところを田中さんとかはこう長年あの取り組まれてるのかなと思いますけども実際そういったことをやってる立場としてどういうふうに思われますかねあのお話聞いてていや本当に思うんですけどなんかこうフードテックとかって何かこう新しい価値を作るというよりも今までもともとあったものにもう一回力を与えるとかあるいはそのスマートキッチンとかって言った時にあのよく議論になるのがあのスマートになるのは誰なんだみたいな家電はスマートになるけど人がバカになってるんじゃないかとかそうするとやっぱりこうあのもともとやっぱり世の中にはもうこうすごい循環した仕組みがあるしあったし食にもものすごい価値があるとやっぱりなんかそういった食が持っているその力とかインパクトだとかあと毎日我々が食べているものがどういうふうにその体にそして環境に影響を与えるのかってことを考えるのがすごい重要でそういったことを気づかせるための私はあのフレームワークというか技だと思ってましてで最近あの消費者という言葉が本当にいいのかっていう議論もあるんですよね。で消費者って言ってしまうと消費で全てが終わってしまうので実は消費して食べたところから実はその循環が始まっていてそれが土に戻るとかそういったようなこの循環をこう考えるっていうこともすごい大事になってくるので実は私はあの本当にこう人間がもう一回こうなんかこう食が持ってる良さとか環境が持ってる力とかそういったことになんか気づいていく。っていうような動きはなんか出てきてるのかなって気がしますね。で、ますますそういったことをなんか一瞬考えていきたいなって改めて思いました。はい、ありがとうございます。確かにあの食というと食べて排泄して微生物がそれ分解してまた土に戻って栄養になっていくっていう元から由来は循環するものが食だったと思うんですけど、田中さんおっしゃるように確かに我々消費者という位置づけはちょっとステータス的になんかこれ止まってるというのは確かにおっしゃる通り。だからバリューチェーンが左から右に流れるものじゃないはずなんですよね。はい、そこからぐるっと戻るはずでやっぱりそのバリューサークルなんじゃないかとか,なんかそういったことをやっぱりこう皆さん自然に言い出すようになってきてるのでそんなことをこう産業にかか携わる人たちも普通に議論できるようになってくるといろんなビジネスが変わってくるんだろうなっていう気が、あのー、しますね。はい、そうですね
実際そういった意味ではそういう,こうまさに循環型の農業ということをあのビジネスでやられている立場としてこう実際いろんな市場の方々、まあ、一般的に消費者という方々とも接する機会とか農業をやっている方とも接する機会が多いと思いますけど実際皆さんその一般の方々の意識って変わってきてますかね私はすごくもう10年やってるので変わってきたなと感じてましてやっぱ農業を始めた時は本当にその産地のブランド化されたものとかやっぱりこうとにかく安くて鮮度が良かったら野菜が売れるっていうことだったのでなんかその農業の奥にあるものとかそういうことってそこまで意識はなかったと思うんですよね。それがあの、まあ、本当にこうだんだんだんだんこう未来が近づいてくるにつれてやっぱみんなのこう意識も高くなってきたっていうこともありますし SDGs という目標が世界でも発表された時に、まあ、日本もやっぱりその食で行き詰まってるとこがあると思うんですよねだからそれをどういうふうにしたらこの日本の資源も生かしながらでしかも持続可能なものにしていくかっていうことをあの本当にこう食に携わっていない人でもやっぱ食イコール生きるということだと思うので特にこうコロナもあると本当にそのもっともっと命の部分っていうのにすごくこう近づいて考えが近づいてきたというかなんかそういう中でもっと食ってこう見直されてきて私自身もその6次産業だけじゃなくてもちろん普通に成果として野菜も販売をしてるんですけど。今までの,その、まあ、マルシェとかで野菜を売ってるのと、まあ、今あの、農家として野菜を売ってるのでは、お客さんの,あの質問とか、あのその農に対する意識とかが、ま,あ、まるで10年で変わったなということは感じてます,そうです、ね、それは先ほど田中さんがおっしゃってたあた、価値のロングテール化っていうところとも、確かにつながるので、うんあの、切り口は違うんですけど、多分同じ結論に至ってるってことは、やはり。一般の方も含めていろんな食の価値の多様化というところに皆さん考え始めていて、うん、その先に多分新しいこのフードシステムみたいなものがあのできていくということなのかなというふうには聞いててちょっと思いました、うんね、あのちょっとすみませんあの時間がもうすでになくてですね<笑>大変申し訳ないんですけど一<笑>つ,つい,いですかそうですね、はい、あの先ほど出たあの、まあ、バリューチェーンとこの、はいまあ、ビジネスですよねまあ、私もあのあのできるだけ少ない時間でちょっと紹介したんですけれどもそのやっぱりプライベートセクターのですね民間企業の,その,あのロールは大きいと思いますんでまああの産業といってもまあ我々あの SDGs9 産業ですよね産業イノベーションインフラあのユニードはメインあの支援してますけれども,、うん、もう産業の中にアグリフードも入ってますんでやっぱり農業の上であのそのアグリフードという産業もあるのでそこでやっぱり日本の民間企業でもその、えー、途上国の民間企業でも非常にあの大事と思いますんでそちらのステークホルダーも入れてですねあの、うん、あの支援できればあのすごくいいと思いますんで。はいあのそれはコメントです。すいません。はい、ありがとうございます。今フェルナさんがおっしゃったことってすごくあのすごくなんていうのかなあのもう本当にピンポイントで重要で、例えば20年前とかそれまあ15年前でもいいんですけど、京都とか農業とかいった本当に生産者とかあと市場で売ってるところとかそこのピンポイントでしか見てなかったと思うんですよね。でだけどあの、本当に今回、システムっていう言葉が言うように、さっきあの私、食やのその食べ物を巡るあれやこれや全部って言ったんですけど、いや本当に全部そのひっくるめてまとめてホリスティックにものを考えていこうねっていう考え方がこう、うん、なんていうんでしょうあの、進みつつあるっていうのは、すごくいい方向だと思うし、最近の,その変化の中でも、あのすごく、なんでしょう、あのもう本当に手放しでパチパチっと褒めたたいていい。みん,なみんなも頑張りましょう、その方法でっていうような流れじゃないかなと思うので、これ大事にしたいなと私は思ってます、はい。ありがとうございます。ちょっと時間があの押してきちゃいましたんで、まあ、今回ですねあの、いろんな切り口でお話はいただきましたけれども、あの結構皆さん似たようなあの切り口、の最終的な言いたいことはあの結論だったのかなと思ってまして、一つ目はやはり一番最初に言った経済であったり、社会、環境、そういったもののバランスの中で、どう持続可能な社会を作っていくのかっていうのを考えるっていうのが大事ですねとでそういったものを作っていくにあたってやはり一方の目線からとかあのピンポイントだけで考えててもダメで
もう少し線でだったりあのサークルという形でさまざまなプレイヤーがつながっていき、まあ、それも食産業の方だけではなくて食はすべての人に関わるものなのでいろんなプレイヤーの方が一緒につながっていってその中で新しいフードシステムというのを作っていくというのがあの大事なんだということがあったかなと思っています。あとはあの、まあ、資源はやはり有限なのでそういう貴重な資源をどう使うのかということであったりあとそのテクノロジーですねテクノロジーもあのどのように使うのかってによって変わってきますという話だったかなと思うのでそういったものを生かしながらそういったフードシステムを作っていくのがこの先の未来につながっていくのかなとは思っていておりますあの今回ですねあの視聴いただいた皆様方食産業以外の方もいろいろいらっしゃると思いますけども先ほどもちょっと出たようにあの食というものはあの食産業の方だけが関わるものではなくてですね全ての方々が日常的に関わるものだと思いますのでそれぞれの立場で今回のこのセッションの中で出てたような考え方とか動きそういったものをちょっと意識していただいて、えー、少しずつでも参加いただく考えていただくそれが今後の新しい食のシステムを作っていくのに非常に重要かなと思っておりますので。ぜひ皆さんも参画いただいてですね、持続可能な社会の実現に向けて努力していければと思っておりますので、皆さんもよろしくお願いいたします。はい、ではあの今回あの動画の皆様方ありがとうございました。あと視聴者の皆様方もありがとうございました。以上をもちましてジャパンセッションの方は終了とさせていただきます。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。どうも。ありがとうございました。Well, that video, I hope you managed to at least catch some of that. That has made me very hungry. And we actually have Benjamin Swan, who founded that company, on our panel discussion. Well, good morning, everyone, or at least good morning from Rome. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're logging in from.、Um, and welcome to this session on building climate resilient farming to boost a green recovery, which is organized by the United Nations Environment Program. My name is Thin, and I'm the food and climate correspondent for the Thomson Reuters Foundation, and I'll be your moderator for this session. First, before we start on the panel discussion, I'd like to、um, invite James Lomax, who is the food systems and agriculture advisor for UNAP, who is going to be giving the opening remarks and essentially set the scene for this session of Voices of Food Systems. James, all yours. Thank you so much, Nen. And, and yes, you're calling in from Rome. I'm calling in from East Africa. And I think we have many other people from all over the world here on this panel, too.、Um, <clears throat> I just want to reiterate that that was a great video. Very much looking forward to hearing what Benjamin has to say later. So, on behalf of UNEP, welcome.、Um, UNEP is very excited to a, host this session of the 24 hour relay to celebrate World Food Day, but also we're very proud to be playing such an important role in the UN Food Systems Summit, which is going to be around the General Assembly next year, so September 2021. And we're involved in it in many ways, but the thing that I'm most pa passionate about is the way that UNEP can start to mobilize. A conversation, a global um, uh, um, discussion, if you like, that's going to build momentum across environmentalists, across nutritionists, across agriculture, and hopefully across societies to make sure that there is a global momentum building for change when we hit the summit period at the end of Q3 next year. So, why is UNEP? So passionate and so engaged in food systems as well. Food systems are absolutely, it, I mean, they, they are one of the biggest drivers of environmental degradation that, that, that we have in this world right now.、Um, and 
But yet at the same time, I firmly believe that if we play our cards right and we start to do things well, then food systems can actually play in the end, have a net positive impact on our environment. They can make things better for us. There's no way, there's no reason that, that agriculture cannot be a net positive influence on our lives when it comes to environment, when it comes to nutrition, and also when it comes to farmers. Because of course, one of the one of the pieces of work that I've been doing for the last few years is working on sustainable rice. And one of the key things that always struck me when I was in various countries in Southeast Asia and South Asia was the age, was the age of the farmers. So we have to generate um, a, a sort of a, a, and, and, and motivate and inspire a younger generation of farmers to come through. Now, that won't be done if our food systems are still in the way that they are in the shape that they are now. So, so hopefully in the next hour, we can really hear some fantastically inspiring models and examples about how we can um, change our food systems for the better. So for the better when it comes to the environment, livelihoods and nutrition. So the summit itself, like I said, is going to be in Q3 next year. And there are going to be several elements there. There, there are going to be action tracks and there are going to be cross-cutting themes. So the action tracks, there are going to be five of them and they range, range from access to food to shifting consumption patterns to um, <clears throat> boosting positive um, uh, nature positive production to livelihoods to adaptation and re resilience. And critically, there are going to be cross-cutting themes like gender, um, innovation, and finance. And but one of the things that that is launching today and 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 um, is very exciting is something called the Food System Summit Dialogue. And the Food Systems Food System Summit Dialogue, sorry, it's a bit of a mouthful, is the process where the summit is going to catalyze um, uh, food systems discussions facilitated food systems discussions in every single member state, which will hopefully build awareness, build momentum, and get us to a point where our understanding of why we have to change our food systems is absolutely front and center when it comes to Agenda 2030 in the SDGs, and also what we're going to do after the um, food systems uh, uh, summit. So once again, on behalf of the unit, very proud to have you here, very proud to have you within here as the um, as the as the, the moderator. Um, I wish you all the best. Floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. Thanks for that um, <clears throat> remarks. Concise, but excellent. And I think the whole point about how, you know, agriculture being one of the biggest drivers of you know, ecosystem degradation, but also the fact that they could be solutions. I think that's something that we need to, you know, keep in the back of our mind, our mind whenever we talk about agriculture, because, you know, we all know that agriculture drives a lot of the emissions, but we also know that agriculture is extremely vulnerable to swings in weather. I mean, I remember interviewing a scientist who once said that, you know, that the, the, the relationship between agriculture and climate change is almost like an unhappy marriage. They're so intertwined but they're sort of hostile to each other. But I think it's really important to remember that we can have climate resilient farming, which of course is what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and we have a diverse but fantastic set of speakers all across from Asia um, with very you know, interesting but different experiences all working towards this goal of um, building resilience in the farming systems. And now speakers, uh, once I introduce you, if you could switch on your videos, that would be great so the audience um, can see you. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly introduce them. We have Louise Mabulo, who is the founder of the Cacao Project and one of the winners of UNEP Champions of the Earth from last year, hi Louise. Um, we also have another Louise, Louise Chan, who is the co-founder of Viet Harvest. She's calling in from Sydney. And last but not least, we have Ben Benjamin Swan, who's the co-founder and CEO of Sustainer Group, whose video you saw earlier, um, just before the session started. 
Now, before we actually start the discussion, I'm just going to briefly explain how we've structured it. We have about 30 minutes or so um, for the discussion, and we're extremely lucky to have this much time with three brilliant people. Um, and I hope to be able to sort of, you know, dig deeper into why they're doing what they're doing, what, you know, how what they're doing is, 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 is helping to build up this climate resilient farming system. Um, and if you, you know, um, have any questions, any burning questions towards our um, speakers, there are multiple ways of sending them across. And um, I understand that this session is being tweeted live on Twitter, um, as well as on Facebook and YouTube. So send your questions through there and we'll try and get to a few of them. If you can, please do identify yourself and your organization when you are sending in the questions. Now, I'm gonna start off the questions and I want to start off with Louise Amabolo. Louise, you started out as a, a, a junior master chef, right? Um, as a protege in the Philippine culinary system, but you've sort of gone beyond that, gone beyond just the cooking aspect to gone into, you know, the, the more nitty gritty aspects of farming. Tell me, tell me a bit more about the cacao project and what you're doing and, and, and what you're hoping to achieve. Definitely. I mean, I started the cacao project. At the beginning, I was a chef who was trying to advocate farm to table food. But when we were hit by Typhoon Nock 10, I knew that it was about time to do something more. So I started the cacao project, which is an agricultural venture in the Philippines, building resilient livelihoods for farmers by equipping them with training and resources that they need to be positioned for sustainable success. So we work on promoting sustainable, traditional and regenerative farming practices and harnessing the power of our forests really and our landscapes to rethink the way that we produce our food and work with our community to transform their lives and their their livelihoods so that they understand their value to our economy and also to the biodiversity and environment that we have in our systems. Thanks, Louise. Um, just as a follow up question, uh, you know, you're told you're working with farmers, you're looking at, you know, like you said, the power of the forest, regenerative. Um, but, you know, farming and, and James just now mentioned that as well, right, is, is seen as quite a quite an old sector and it's, it's, it's quite predominantly male. At least that's the perception of it, you know, as, as a young woman, I mean, I'm sure you must have faced lots of um, challenges. Just just tell us, you know, what keeps you going? How do you overcome them? I mean, definitely as a young woman in agriculture and food, I'm constantly battling with these cultural stigmas in the industry, along with pre existing mindsets of people's perception of agriculture. I mean, in the Philippines, it's often associated to poverty, strife. It's in schools, they're taught that agriculture is a failure of a career choice. And, you know, young people have stopped viewing it as a viable career choice. But personally, I'm really hopeful that through the work that we're doing, that many people are doing around the world right now, that we can begin to deconstruct these ideas and show people that agriculture can't just it's not just cool but it can also intrinsically act as an environmental stewardship um, through regenerative agriculture and through working with your communities in the social aspect with the work that we do it's very it's very similar to that so hopefully people will begin to understand it and change their perception and you know the work that I'm doing is really inspired by being at the forefront of deconstructing these ideas and hopefully more people will come to understand that as the years go by. And have you seen, have you noticed any changes or, you know, from once you started out in terms of younger people uh, and more women perhaps getting more interested in, in, in farming and, and, and issues around farming? I mean, definitely. I'm really excited to talk about this because ever since quarantine has started, a lot of people have had more time to cultivate their own green spaces within our community. And it's so inspiring to see that more young people are proudly posting that, oh, I'm starting to farm these vegetables. I'm starting to farm food. I'm maximizing the land that we have here in the provinces. Since many people here are heirs to land spaces that they don't know what to do with. And now people are starting to understand that I can cultivate these green spaces. They have the time to do that. And they're starting to see it as a viable option for their careers more young people more women definitely and they're utilizing social media as a way to show off and be proud of it and outreach more people to do something similar which is absolutely fantastic great thanks louise and i think that's been you know um if there is some sort of a little silver lining of the past six months um in this very strange you know tragic um, experience with the pandemic i think is that people are suddenly realizing um, how precious food is 
and the importance of shorter supply chains, the importance of where the food comes from and how, you know, instead of just turning up at a, at a shop and, and, and supermarket and expecting it to be there. So that's, that's, that's interesting to hear from you. Um, I want to now move to um, Singapore, actually, um, and keen to hear from Ban, um, who is joining us from another conference. Um, he's been talking most of today, um, but I'm going to have to ask him to talk a little bit more about his vertical farm, because I'm really uh, quite keen to hear about it. It's quite high tech. We saw some of it in the video. Ben, um, take us through the process of, of, your, of, of your vertical farm. So the journey for us started back in 2013. Um, I think if, if you caught the video, you could see that it was quite literally in a basement. It was underneath the pool. It was 42 degrees and 100% humidity. And we were growing products like arugula, and that's impossible because arugula needs to be grown between 18 to 20 degrees. And, and we figured that, uh, or we actually learned through, through Google, that if you could trick the plant to think that it was cold, um, they could possibly grow. So we actually chilled the water and it worked. Um, so we learned there that we could grow impossible products in impossible places. Um, we started growing incredible products like kale, arugula, very similar to how they're grown outdoors. And specifically here in Singapore, a lot of Singaporeans don't eat like they like to eat raw produce. Um, they don't like bitter produce. So you know, we obviously want our customers to get the best nutrition from the plant. We took this feedback from them, and then we learned through the power of controlled environments by adapting the air temperature, the humidity, the macro and micronutrients. We could actually change the characteristics of the plants. So the kale that we grow today is actually Singaporean kale. Um, we've now launched into Hong Kong and we are growing the Singaporean recipe out there, but we might find that Hong Kongers like the kale slightly more bitter, slightly more tough, and we can definitely grow that for them. So, you know, the, the, the importance of what we're doing is that we can grow any product as long as it's a short life cycle product like leafy greens, for example, anywhere in the world. Um, now we start to think about the food value system. What's happening today is that geographic restraint is having farmers around the world just grow one or two products at volume, okay? Um, that is then having to be traded across the world. And that's what's creating a vast amount of waste. When we think about leafy greens, as much as 70% of produce of that leafy green is wasted just to get it to the end consumer. It's not through the farming practices. It's just literally the time that it takes to get to the end consumer. Now, that's really sobering. Now, when you actually think about uh, the carbon emissions, there's this misconception about vertical farms being uh, inefficient or not sustainable because we use a lot of electricity. Um, we've run a recent study to one of the closest areas where we get a lot of these uh, European varieties, which is the east coast of Australia. So to get one kilo of lettuce from Brisbane to Singapore takes 7.2 kilos of carbon. 6.8 of that is just on logistics. It's huge. Uh, we grow it here, one kilo of lettuce using SP power, 600 grams. We're one twelfth the carbon emission, right? So we now start to think about the ecosystem and how do we disrupt with vertical farming? What vertical farmers really need to do is really think about displacing imports, right? Then the farmers can actually start to think about growing produce back for their community again. I think that this is where vertical farming needs to pivot. We need to move away from growing the easy stuff. We need to grow the difficult stuff. That's why at Sassanere, we're growing products like kale, arugula, the stuff that we need to displace, the stuff that comes from long distances. And we can focus on the USPs for customers that they care about 100% clean, traceable, sustainable, lasts a long time in the fridge, so zero waste. Um, you, I want to follow up on something that you mentioned just now about how, you know, there's this perception um, that vertical farms are not energy efficient or that they use up, you know, a lot more energy. And, uh, 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 and I'm sure you've heard of other perceptions, not just in terms of, of energy usage, but just this whole idea that vertical farms are, are sort of not natural, right? Not, not in the same way as doing it traditional way um, on the outside. Um, or that they're not, you know, they're, they're not as good or, or, or that um, the produce is inferior. Um, how mm -hmm. do you respond to, to, to those questions and criticisms? With science, uh, simply put. So we've done tests on our kale, for example, versus the stuff that comes from Australia. Um, now, whether it's because 
the products here are ultra fresh or whether it is actually because of the environment itself, we don't know yet. Uh, but through our tests, we're seeing that our kale actually has five times the manganese. That's the stuff that fights cancer. It's, it's got um, four times vitamin C, it's got 60% more calcium and 40% more iron. So not only are we able to grow so it tastes better, but it's actually more nutritious as well. Now, back to the point about science, you know, we're using technology to replicate what happens outdoors. It's a scientific process of photosynthesis. The plants need radiation from the sun. Uh, we replicate that with technology using diodes to use the very specific wavelengths that that variety needs. Um, the macro and micronutrients in the water, we suspend clean elements in water as opposed to letting bugs decompose into the soil and, and, then, and then feed the plants or fertilize the, the soil. So it's there's no difference from what we're doing indoors. We're just using technology to enable us to control the environment and make it hyper efficient. Um, for our growing process, for one standard floor in a building, we're talking about a three meter slab to slab clearance, we can grow 178 times more efficient, times more efficient than outdoor farms. But that growth can be perpetual based on the number of floors that we have or occupy inside of a building. Um, lots more things that I can follow up with you on, but I just wanna to stick to one before we move to Louise from Viet Harvest. And, um, you know, if, any young entrepreneur is interested in doing this, you know, what would be your top advice? What kind of advice would you give them to? What are the things they need to think of? What are the things they need to consider? Start slow, start small, learn, learn, learn. You know, when, when I started this back, when my business partner and I started this back in the day, um, it was still quite early. Um, I traveled the globe from Japan through to Amsterdam, met with professors, operators, um, indoor, outdoor, greenhouse, everyone's doing it completely different. Um, so we had to come up with our own hypothesis on how we thought growing would happen. And then we had to take it for a very, very long test drive. One of the things that I learned early in the game is that the industry is very fragmented. Um, you can't expect to take technology, even if it is hydroponic technology, you can't take that, plug that into a building and expect it to grow efficiently. You will need to learn how to adapt the hardware, the software with the methodology and come up with your own ideas. Um, that is where the industry is right now. And I would encourage that the industry keeps doing that because we don't know what is the best way to do it. We see so many different ways of growing indoors and we should become specialists in all of our own independent ways before we start to come and collaborate and then see how we can integrate some of these different techniques to make it even more efficient in the future. Great, thanks, Ben. Um, I'll come back to you on the second round. I wanna now uh, move on to the Sydney Vietnam venture um, with Louise Chan, Viet Harvest. Of course, you know, both Louise um, from the Philippines and Ben had to talk about uh, trying to produce uh, nutritious food in a sustainable manner that is, you know, ecologically sound as well. However, it is also equally crucial to make sure that that food actually reaches the markets and the people who need it most and not get wasted along the supply chain. And that's exactly what Viet Harvest, I understand, is hoping to do. Um, Louise, uh, can you tell us a bit more about uh, uh, the venture itself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you so much for having me on, uh, on this panel. Uh, really interesting discussion and I'm so inspired already by Louise and Benjamin. Um, so Vit Harvest is essentially um, a food rescue organisation, um, a social enterprise is what we've set up in Vietnam to, to rescue surplus food that doesn't make it um, you know, to consumers and then to redistribute that to those in need. Um, it's a concept that's tried, tested and proven. Um, it is based on the Australian model, Oz Harvest. Um, but what, it, what, what the Viet Harvest model um, is seeking to do as well is build social enterprise into its DNA. Um, and we've done that through a partnership and working in collaboration with Koto um, and Koto's founder, Jimmy Pham. Um, Koto has been running in Vietnam, started off in Hanoi um, 20 years ago, uh, and Oz Harvest itself has been running for the last 16 years, 
rescuing and distributing food in Australia. Um, and so what Vit Harvest does is it's combining, our vision is combining um, th these two wonderful organisations, bringing food rescues to life in Vietnam and, um, you know, testing out the model that really surplus food should not be going to waste. And if there is surplus food, whether it's along the supply chain from the farms to the supermarkets, to hotels, restaurants, catering companies, that food should not be going to waste and it should be used, um, utilised to feed those underserved communities. So that's, that's our vision and what we, we aim to do. Now, I understand that you just started Viet Harvest quite recently, is that correct? Correct, correct. Registered officially um, as a social enterprise in June of this year. Okay, right. I mean, I was going to say, you know, obviously your organization has a social bent, so it doesn't, you know, have to, in a way, worry as much about, you know, pro profitability or, you know, revenue in the, in, in the, perhaps in the same way as a traditional company. But, you know, a lot of people would shy away from setting up something new um, because of so much uncertainty with, with, with the global, you know, economy and all the stuff, stuff that has been brought about by, you know, obviously the pandemic. I mean, what made you take the plunge? What made you decide that now actually is the time I want to do this? Um, well, personally, I actually met Jimmy Pham a, a few years ago and um, I have a personal connection with Vietnam and, and the intention this year was to have spent a bit of time in Vietnam and, and then along came pandemic, along came COVID. Um, and, you know, the pandemic can stop events. It's, it's going to stop travel. It will stop um, us being able to, to move freely between countries. But what the pandemic isn't stopping is hunger and, and waste. It's still occurring. So it didn't, it didn't really stop Jimmy and my drive to actually create and, and continue on this path of creating Vit Harvest um, because hunger still exists. And if if anything, hunger is even more um, of an issue now than, than pre-COVID. Um, what we're seeing, and I'm, I'm here in Sydney, Australia, is what we're seeing in Australia, even at, at um, uh, Oz Harvest as an organisation, is 50% more demand for food relief within our communities. Um, you know, in, the, in March, when, when Australia was, was faced with COVID, um, to your point that you mentioned earlier, the supermarkets were stripped bare of food because there was panic buying um, and, and people in need were, were the ones that were suffering most without access to the staples like rice and, and pasta. And so um, just it's absurd that, that still today we're wasting 30% of all food that is, is, is produced around the world. You know, it's 1.3 billion tonnes of food that still goes to waste. And it doesn't matter which country we're sitting in, which city we're sitting in, in it's happening all around the world. Um, and that's what our model is, is aiming to tackle, is really fighting food waste and fighting hunger. Great, thank you, Louise. And um, completely, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to just sort of back up your point about food waste, but also Koto, which is a great um, organization in Hanoi. Anyone, if you get a chance to visit Hanoi, um, go and eat at their restaurant, which does just amazing traditional Vietnamese food. And I'm not being paid to advertise this, by the way, it's just my own personal <laughs> experience. Um, now, before excuse me, um, we're actually starting to get a couple of questions um, already online, but I want to actually go through another round of questions with our speakers before we open it to the floor. Um, of course, you know, a, a lot of you have discussed this, James has talked about this as well, the big news this year and probably well into next year, I think is going to be the coronavirus pandemic and its impact. Um, and there's a lot of talk about how do we make sure that recovery from this is going to be green, that it is going to be environmentally sustainable and that it's socially equitable. And of course, that is also the theme of our talk today. Um, so I have the same question to all three of our speakers. Um, um, and I want to start with uh, uh, Louise from the Cacao Project. How do you think your business or your project could help boost the green recovery um, from the coronavirus pandemic and build resilience for future shocks, whether they're another pandemic or a weather-related disaster? I mean, one of the main pillars of the Cacao Project is that we're hoping to build a food system in small communities that enables them to understand their value in our economy, 
and our biodiversity, our environment, and in the restoration of our planet. So we're breaking down these stigmas existing around agriculture, but we're also taking a closer look at how we can harness our resources and rethink food systems that they can maximize their land use and land management to work with nature instead of against it for better harvests. And with the capacity building we're doing within communities, we're ensuring that our farmers won't be beholden by times of crisis, but instead they'll thrive and be an integral part of turning it around and using it for the better of people and planet. Great, thanks. Ben, do you want to go next? Sure. Um... You know, when we talk about food resilience, in the past, it was very much um, partnering with neighboring countries to figure out how you can feed your community, right? Um, places like Singapore and Hong Kong, very dependent on imports because there's a limitation of land. So I think in, in both countries still today, 90% is imported, which is quite huge. So they, didn't, they, they don't even have accessibility to grow staple produce. Um, so with COVID, we see borders shut down. Right. Fortunately, we were still able to move food across borders. But what happens if that pandemic is worse and even food can't move across? So consumers and governments alike are starting to get very concerned about how do we feed our community? And food resilience is no, more, no longer about creating great partnerships with neighboring countries. It's actually about how do we produce food today locally? OK, now in the green recovery effort, when we talk about what we're doing in Sustainer, which is displacing imports, okay? Now, I talked earlier about how much food is wasted, just getting it to the end consumer. Every kilo we displace as an import means that there is less food waste. There's less carbon emission. The reality is that today, forestry and agriculture has the largest contribution towards carbon emission. Second to uh, industry, as a direct and indirect, but if you just take the direct, farming and agriculture is the largest. Now, we know that global warming is making our outdoor farming footprints less effective. So we're having to produce more farming land to grow the same amount. Um, our only piece of technology that allows us to combat global warming are trees. And we're having to knock those down to feed ourselves. Something needs to happen. And we believe that by addressing this, this centralized farming system and and competing with imports as much as possible especially for highly perishable products like leafy greens and herbs um, this is a way that we can definitely address the food waste issue and the carbon emission through logistics great thanks um i i lived in singapore for six years at one point actually so i'm like keenly aware of the the reliance on imports and the worries that uh, the authorities and the locals have uh, particularly of when it comes to, you know, self-sufficiency of food. And I think it's really interesting to see Singapore uh, making such concerted effort to try and shore up the local supply chain. Um, you know, just it just makes sense in so many ways. Um, Louise um, from Bit Harvest, um, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, I'll add to that. And I'll also share that, you know, on, on, on the opposite end in Australia, we actually produce enough food to feed 60 million people um, yet every year we're wasting in Australia $20 billion worth of that food and that, that is just absolutely absurd. Um, so taking it back to the global, um, you know, the, the global statistics, you know, if, if food waste were, were a country, um, you know, the, the, the methane emissions that it releases when it goes to landfill would be the third highest emitter um, of, of, of methane and that, that is absolutely just insane. Um, so concepts, concepts like Vit Harvest, um, you know, the concept and the model that Oz Harvest has built that's now expanded into South Africa, to the UK, to New Zealand and, and now Vietnam, um, you know, we're really aiming to, 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 to start small, um, as Benjamin said, start small and with one meal that's saved, one kilo of food that is saved from going to landfill um, that could feed someone, that is truly, truly powerful. Um, and it is up to it is up to everyone. It is up to all of us. It isn't um, just a matter of blaming blaming governments or blaming um, industries or blaming farmers or blaming corporations. It actually is a matter of everyone's responsibility to ensure that we do um, not waste food, but also um, have enough um, 
resources for our planet enough to feed people um, in 2030, 2050 and years to come. Great, thanks Louise. James, do you want um, to make any comments, comment on, 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 on some thoughts? Thank, thank you so much, Thin, and, and um, I'm really enjoying this conversation. So, so thank you so much, the moderation, excellent. Um, so, you know, so <clears throat> I see in front of me on entrepreneurs, um, game changers, um, and, and that for me is fantastic. What worries me a little bit is how these, these game changing ideas and, and these self starters fit in to something that is broader than that. Because my worry, and, and it's been there for a few years now, is that, is that um, these examples are fantastic, but are they really helping move the needle at the national level? And I say that as I, I was an agricultural entrepreneur myself before joining the UNEP um, businesses in, in East Africa. Um, and, and actually I was growing a, a, a lettuce and a baby leaf and sending them across Europe. <laughs> so when Ben, you were talking about the carbon footprint, I know all about it, trucking, you know, the, the trucking washed leaves from Southern Europe to, to the UK, the, the, the various things. But the, the issue about COVID, and I think what we have to be clear about this is that COVID has thrown up all sorts of very tragic and unforeseen impact you know um, people in the where I live people are very very close to food security so if people if if suddenly the economy locked down then people that drove motorbike taxis for a living within a week they were food insecure so you know it's 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 not about how food has been grown here it's about the affordability and the access to that food. Um, but let's not forget that, that, that before COVID happened, we, the case for transforming our food system was huge, was massive, right? And I think we have to be very, very careful that while COVID has, 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 has created some very, very interesting questions, we've got to be very, very careful while building back, what do we build back to? And I think we can go one of two ways, right? We can put fiscal, massive fiscal incentive back into reinforcing the existing food system. And the existing food system is, is a food system that, that does not in general bring fresh food to market. It brings processed food to market. Generally, it, it doesn't look after smallholders. It, it asks smallholders to consolidate and turn into medium and large, large scale holders. Exactly how we've seen <laughs> generations in, in the countries, right? And, and I see this trend in, in the rest of the world. And, and, and we also see that obesity and NCDs are growing exponentially in countries that quite frankly it shouldn't be. Right, with such strong food cultures. Um, and I'm not just talking about the OECD countries, I'm talking about across the world now. So, so or we can make a choice. And this, I think, is where the food system summit comes in. Why I'm, I'm, this is the vision, that we get a circuit breaker, that this creates this idea that, hang on a second, at the top level, it's not right that we waste all all this food. It's not right that we ignore smallholders. It's not right that that um, um, uh, fresh produce is 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 traded across the world. And it is a circuit breaker for us to look at our food system at a national level and say, "Hang on a second. What do we need to 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 make our food system more equitable, more climate resilient, better when it comes to nutrition?" And, and this is where Sustainer, this is where Oz Harvest, this is where the Cacao Project comes in, it crowds in to, to, to form and shape this conversation, this, this national conversation. So 
actually with COVID, we have two choices. It's either we reinforce the existing status quo or, and this is the whole point of the summit, that we get cracking and we start to, 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 to mobilize our, our, our networks and we try to reach, we, we, we have to reach the people that make the decisions and convince them that we have to reset. Thank you. Great, thanks James. Um, and in a way, yes, I think it's great to have this uh, the, the speakers that we do today, almost like a glimpse into the possible future if we, you know, go into the right direction, right? So hopefully this is the direction, like you said, we have two choices and this is the choice that hopefully, you know, how do we get these, 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 these people with lots of entrepreneur ideas and, you know, game-changing ideas into the bigger conversation and get people on board. And um, we do have a couple of questions coming through. Um, just to give uh, both James and Van a warning, there, there is a, a couple of questions on vertical farming, but I want to start with Louise from the Cacao Project. Um, there's a question coming through from um, internet that says, you know, how did you even come to the idea of creating this project? And, you know, how did you engage the farmers in the Philippines? I mean, were they open to it? Was it difficult to try and, you know, like go in and um, brand new face and like say, I think, I think I've got a great idea. Yeah, when I first started, it began as a typhoon relief effort. So it did not start very easily. We just gave away seedlings. And after some time, we realized that this is, you know, just helping people on the surface level is putting a bandaid on top of an existing problem, which is our yearly typhoons, our yearly, our climate crisis and everything that's going on in for, with our farmers in our community. And we wanted to find a way to kind of help them. So we did a lot of research, what worked best in our weather, our ecosystem, um, what worked best in our community. And we came off with cocoa as a long-term sustainable crop. But then it wasn't just that, it was also managing and developing land so that it was more, um, it was more, well, one of them is more productive and another one was our land management would be better. So people in the Philippines, we have this law called agrarian reform where we have limited land space. And so people can't mechanize in a way that profits them. And people can't actually develop land as well because it, they would lose a lot of profit. So bringing in regenerative agriculture is also bringing in this new sense of, you know, improving our soil quality, improving our biodiversity and the productivity of the things that we've already been farming for years, but also looking to the future because a lot of the farmers are losing a lot of their coconut and rice because of number one, typhoons. Another thing is because they've been growing those for years and now it's not as productive as it should be. So with cocoa and other things that we're bringing in, it's really getting them to reimagine that um, and see a different vision for the future. And farmers weren't exactly, uh, open to the idea to begin with. It was very difficult as a young woman in, a, in the Philippines to tell them, oh, I know something and I think you would love this. But slowly the results kind of showed for itself when the first group of farmers that we worked with were making income and were showing people, oh, this is, this is what our farms look like now. It's really well developed. We've got all these crops coming in. We're becoming a food basket from nearby cities. They were saying, hang on a minute. I kind of really like that idea. You know what, I'll go give it a try. And then slowly people started approaching us and it grew into what we are now. We're working with over 200 farmers and we've um, kind of reforced it a span of 85 hectares of land as productive, sustainable farms. So it's absolutely exciting to see how it's transformed. And going forward with um, this post pandemic, yeah, we're kind of empowering our farmers to understand their value now that food security is a huge issue in countries like ours. Great, thanks, Louise. Um, the next two questions, they're sort of linked um, on vertical and urban farming. So I'm going to direct that to Ben and, 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 and James because that's um, it was directed to them as well. Ben, the question is, you know, what do you think is needed to make vertical farming systems um, become more, you know, mainstream and not just seen as a, a, a niche business or, or something, you know, uh, maybe only a selected a number of cities or places can actually do? The, the reality is that there, there are a number of companies around the world right now that have the technology ready to scale. Um, we need support. I mean, it is a brick and mortar business and, and it's an expensive business that we need to scale up. So funding is really key here. Um, Louise raised a, a point about community support, you know, at the end of the day, 
Um, we can do all this great stuff, um, but as I say, you can only you, you can't you can lead a horse to water, right? So, what we need is to create more awareness around why we're doing the things that we're doing. Um, we're doing this for them. We're doing this to create a product that is truly traceable, right? Um, 100% clean. This is when we talk about indoor 100% clean, that means not only zero pesticides, but not even haze pollution, heavy metals. This is like pharmaceutical grade food. So get behind your uh, local farmers, get behind your vertical farms, because the more you support them, the more that they're going to grow as a business and the more that they'll grow great produce for you. That's great advice. Um... James, um, slightly, I guess, similar, you know, so I guess vertical farming has been around, obviously, before the pandemic, but I guess the pandemic and everything has sort of highlighted, right, the need for locally grown food, and that is definitely one way. So there's this urban farming movement, some of which is through vertical farming, some of which is through peri-urban. Um, how can the UN support this movement that sort of emerged during the lockdown? And do you think this movement can actually help make the food systems much more resilient? So thank you very much. Um, I think, again, before these movements were happening before, and, and Ben said, look, they've been working since 2013. So, so, so this idea of, of, of kind of using the urban space to grow food is not a new one. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad, I, I, I didn't know that it's, that it's actually um, uh, increased during the, the COVID time. So, so what can the UN do to support? The UN, what the UN can do is the UN can lobby for policy change, can, 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 can bring this into, if you like, the, the, the discussion when it comes to food systems because of course when it comes to food systems it's disparate we have extensive farmers large-scale farms small-scale farms we have rural consumers urban consumers ones that have low income ones that have high income so so it's 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 a patchwork of of, of producers and consumers that make up the food system um so so obviously when it comes to kind of if you like urban production this is the key part of the puzzle um, but what I like about it then it's a shame that Angie couldn't make it um, because I, I, I moderated a session with her yesterday um, in preparation for this 24-hour um, shindig um, was about how we can really work we can really start with schools so there are many urban schools that have some space etc and she has something called the the um edible school project i think it is it the edible school project and, and and that's a way if you like of, of that's another piece of the puzzle it's it's about bringing kids into learning how to urban farm to garden etc and to educate them about what food is you know food is not going to the local supermarket to buy processed food food is also buying primary produce <laughs> from your local farmer or from your school or all growing it yourself or your window box, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think the key thing here is that sometimes we feel like the food system is a monolith, right? It's kind of, it is, it's large scale producers feeding its global supply chains being marketed at supermarkets. Well, in reality, it's not like that. So we have to embrace this complexity and we have to encourage all parts of the food systems, including the vertical farms. In, and, and I'd love it if vertical farms becomes a bigger player. And it seems to me that, 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 that Ben, et cetera, is gonna work there. But of course, it's not just that, it's also then making sure that the Oz harvests of this world are really, and the Viet harvests of this world are also bringing this message around valuing your food. So if you do buy it, eat it. <laughs> which is which is this other this is the other ridiculous dichotomy that's happening in our food system thanks james in fact that is my last question we are going to run out of time so i'm going to wrap up so my last question is to louise chan um you were talking about you know os harvest viet harvest just now james and and the question louise is you know as consumers people like myself people who are watching this you know what 
suggestion would you give so that we waste a lot less? Do you, do you have any suggestions? Do you have any tips? We, we, yes, many, many, many tips. But the, the, the most simplest thing is to always look in your fridge and eat what's in your fridge. So look um, at what's in your fridge before going out and buying or ordering more food. Um, when you go to a, when you go and do your shop, just shop for what you need. Um, eat your leftovers. You know, you can create some beautiful dishes from what's already inside your fridge. So just be mindful of, of that practice and be mindful um, each time you, you choose to open your fridge or go to the shops, just be mindful of that waste. Um, and I think uh, to James and Benjamin and Louise's point is just the awareness and the education. These discussions are so valuable in people sharing um, the importance of, of the value of food. You know, not, not everybody knows that when you do throw away an apple or a pear um, or a, a piece of kale or, um, you know, you're wasting the water, the energy, the love and the labor that goes into that. And there's so much more than just that kilo of food. There's so much that goes into growing it. Just don't waste it. Great, thanks. That's a, a nice point to emphasize just before we wrap up. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time. So we're gonna have to end the session, uh, but I just like to, I think, emphasize on a few takeaways personally for me as well, that you know we are aware that food, um, th there are a lot of issues with the way we're currently producing and consuming food. Um, it's not environmentally sustainable. It's also not socially equitable, but food can be a solution, farming, can be cool, it can be about environmental stewardship, right? And science, yeah, science, vertical farming is a big major part of it. Um, a lot of the countries in the world, including Australia, actually produces enough food to feed everyone. We just need to waste a little less so that we can sort of tackle both the hunger and the waste issue. And I guess going forward, um, we have two choices in recovering um, from the coronavirus pandemic, right? We're talking about the green recovery. We can choose to reinforce an existing system that is not working, um, that is making people both hungry and obese, or we can continue, we can try and look into a brighter future, a glimpse that we have gotten from this morning's session, just the session of what it could be. So thank you very much to all our speakers. Um, you're fantastic. You've made my job so much easier. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining us. Hope you have a great day and weekend and perhaps um, you'll stay on um, to watch more sessions of uh, Voices of the Food Systems. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you for bringing your voice to the 24 Global Leader Conversation on Food Systems. The global conversation represents so much of what we hope the coming year will be about. Many people from different walks of life are coming together to engage in solutions-oriented dialogues and to address the root of what we want to achieve over the next 10 years. Our vision is to make this a people's summit, giving voice to citizens in every country of the world. With its activities spread over more than a year, the summit will bring together key players from the world of science, business, policy, healthcare, academia, as well as farmers, indigenous people, youth organizations, consumer groups, environmental activists, everyone, including you. I believe we can all find common ground in which we can grow a sustainable future together. We already know what we want the future to look like. We have the sustainable development goals to guide us and to support how we will measure our progress in achieving the future. Food is the instrument that touches all our lives, and through its lens, we can realize this vision of a better world. We must be bold. We must think and act differently. Transforming our food system is the most powerful action we can take to solve our biggest problems. Join us today. Join the Food System Summit. Join the conversation. Join the global dialogue we are launching today and over the course of the coming year. And together, I'm very confident we can build a just and resilient world where no one is left behind.
Join the conversation. Join the conversation. Join the conversation. Join the conversation. Please join the conversation. Join us today. Join the Food Systems Summit. Join the conversation. This must not be just another conference, right? So this Food Systems Summit, what makes it different? We're focusing on people and solutions. It's on the action tracks that we have that are focused on uh, the homework we will take away from the conference to do are co-chaired by young people as well. And I think that that's important because you bring those solutions to the fore. So you're not just participating in the group, you're actually leading. Thank you, Andy Chavo, for this time and for, for joining this conversation. Join the Thank you for bringing your voice to the table. So good morning, everyone. Happy World Food Day. I'm Sara Roversi. I'm the founder of the Future Food Institute, and I'm really honored to support uh, this incredible initiative of the United Nations Food Systems Summit. So today we started very early for us at 2 a.m. in the morning, kicking off this incredible journey that is taking us all around the world, hearing the voices from the food systems, hearing the voices of the chefs, hearing the voices of institutions, industry leaders, innovators, startuppers, farmers. This is what we're gonna do today. And I'm very, very proud and excited to kick off this new session. Now, I am uh, very glad because um, we are going to start with uh, the voice uh, of uh, a representative from FAO. Maximo Torero, he is the chief economist uh, and deputy secretary general of the FAO, United Nations Agencies for Food and Agriculture. And I want to start with him because um, today is also the birthday of uh, FAO. So it's the 75th birthday of FAO. The crisis we are facing with uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, of course, has been uh, putting all of us uh, under threat. And we all have been seeing the essential needs of humans and uh, le looking really what was invisible until yesterday to many of us. So we need to strengthen food systems from farm to fork. And I think the best way to start is to start with FAO. So Maximo, please join me on stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sara. And let me share my, my screen. Um, I hope you can see it. Uh, give me a second first. Let me share this and share my screen. OK, so can you hear me well? Perfecto. Okay, so thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. This is a, a great initiative and, and we are really happy to be here, especially today, which is our anniversary, 75 years, a, a birthday for FAO. But especially because it's for us a, a breakout point where we have to start to make a difference. And, uh, and, and the whole message of us is grow, nourish, sustain together. Our actions are the future. And that's where the core message is for actions together uh, to be our important, uh, our important future. So let me uh, briefly talk how we are looking at things and, and, and where we are concerned. So these are the, the typical drivers that we were looking at, growing human pressure, which have changed consumption patterns and demands of different types of food, the climate change, which is affecting us, uh, and ecosystem decline, which is something that we are observing and something that we need to make a difference. But there was one more element that, that has come up, which is the surprise. And COVID-19 has become to be a huge surprise for us and something that could create significant consequences. But it's something that also alert us that if we don't start creating the change and we don't do the food system transformation that it was mentioned before by Agnes Calivata, if we don't start this right now, it will be too late. So I think we are still on time to, to create the change. And why this is so important is because the lives of people are at the stake here. We, we have today 690 million people undernourished, uh, 2 billion people that don't have access to, to regular food and safe food, and 3 billion people that don't have access to healthy diets. 
and we are not in track in any of the indicators. The only indicator we are on track is on breastfeeding, but only for 2025. If we continue as we are, we won't achieve the 2030 goal. And COVID-19 comes to make things a little bit more complicated and increase up to 132 million more people undernourished. So the situation is a very, very complicated situation. Uh, and that's why it's not an issue of one agency, an issue of one individual. It's an issue of all of us playing a role youth, uh, middle age, older generations like me, but, but we need to find a way to to change the system in which we, we operate today. Because this, what we could be observing because of COVID-19, will really put us completely off track. So it could end up in 909 million people undernourished by 2030. And this is chronic undernourishment. This is not acute food insecurity, which is normally what the language we use for emergencies, which is temporal. But here, this is chronic undernourishment. So. So what we need to do, we need to look at the drivers. And our core drivers are conflict, climate variability and extremes, economic slowdowns and downturns, and cost and affordability of healthy diets. We have shown that 3 billion people cannot access to healthy diets. And this is behind of all these is inequalities. And what we are observing today with the, with the, with the situation uh, of COVID-19 is that these inequalities will exacerbate, will increase even more. And that's where we need to, to find a way to also tackle inequality. It's not SDG 1, SDG 2. It's also looking at the inequality SDG. Because if we don't remove the inequalities, we don't start to work intensively in reducing them, then we could have a significant problem. And that's what we need to find a way uh, to change. Now, all of these drivers come with a very strong message to us, how we can use food to eliminate or to change these, 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 these drivers, how we can use a system which is resilient to climate variability how we can use a system that can replace conflict for food. WFP just won the Nobel Prize because of that. We need to find ways to create jobs for people in the rural sector so that these drivers don't activate. And that for us is meaning increasing resilience uh, to people. At FAO, we are working with these four accelerators and we call them accelerators because we need to accelerate. Data, big data, real-time data that allow us to target better. Innovation that allow us to be flexible and to respond to actions. Technology, we need to bring as much as possible uh, evidence, scientific evidence based on what technology works, where it works, why it doesn't work, what are the risks. It's not just an issue of rejecting a technology. We need to understand what are the issues behind and what is the evidence. And then we need to bring something really important, which are the complements, which we normally forget about. That is the governance, the capacities in human capital, and the institutions. And if you look carefully at this graph, the complements go in a different direction. And why is that? Because normally, if we just let data, innovation, technology to move, they can move very fast, but they don't necessarily will be inclusive. They don't necessarily will create the reduction of inequality we are looking at. So our job is to bring these complements, no matter they could slow down a little bit the process, but in the medium term, it will accelerate the process better because it will be inclusive and that means it will be sustainable. And that's the change we want to do. So the transformation of the food systems we're looking at is a transformation that brings climate resilience, integrates humanitarian development and peace building policies together, strengthen economic resilience. Also, we do interventions to lower the cost of access to nutritious food so that these 3 billion people can have access to food, healthy diets, pursue dietary patterns with low impact on health and environment, and tackle structural inequalities. That's the transformation of the systems that we are looking at that will make the big difference. And we need to find ways to accelerate that. So with that, Sara, let me thank you again for, for, for this invitation. And, and my message is we need to move now. We need to move fast. We need to move carefully. We need to increase our resilience. And, and we need to, 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 to start and work hard from now onwards. Thank you very much, Sara. Back to you. Thank you so much, Maximo. We really appreciate your words every time because you make uh, every complex uh, com concept clear. We are clearly understanding which are the issues we are facing uh, and uh, we are clearly understanding that we need to work together. So this afternoon, we are going to reconnect with FAO because today there's a huge program that FAO is running everywhere in the world. So also our marathon is going to reconnect with the official launch of uh, the celebration of this very important day. And uh, thanking you, Maximo, I'm going to hand over the mic virtually to the representative of uh, Europe commission the europe they say our europe our 
at the UN in Rome. So she is the representative of Europe at FAO and all the UN organizations. Alexandra Welkenberg, please uh, join me on stage virtually. And I really, I'm really proud of you is acting now because I think that uh, the clear direction uh, you you are sharing uh, with all of us uh, is uh, pushing us to move forward and fast uh, really to achieve the SDGs. With the European Green Deal, with the Farm to Fork strategy, we are all going to be involved in this uh, move uh, toward the sustainable development framework. So I'm really glad to have the European voice uh, with our conversation today. And please, Share with us uh, the voice of Europe. We don't hear you. Maybe without the earphone. No, not working. Sarah, I can go with Alexandra like in a breakout room while you continue and then we can come back again. Okay, perfecto. So you can fix it and we're going to reconnect in a minute. And so we are always talking about our beautiful continent uh, and I want to invite here on Sig, my friend from the Good After COVID experience, Pio Venebost. So Pio is the ambassador of the permanent and permanent representative of Switzerland at FAO, IFED and World Food Program here. Your video is blocked. Uh, Hi, Mr. Wembus. Probably Sarah is having a connectivity issue. Sarah, maybe you will be. You can try like to put your uh, uh, video off for a bit because you are having like yeah. some connectivity okay. issues. Perfect. Thank you. Should I do my pitch? <laughs> yes, please, Bio. <laughs> Thank you. So um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night to everyone. Uh, depends on wh from where, where you are connected. So um, I'm Pio Van Ops from the Foreign Affairs of Switzerland, um, a kind of an island in Europe. Um, so future of the food systems and big transformation. We, we heard from uh, Maximo the elements but I would like to maybe to introduce this in another, from another perspective, um, simply the personal perspective. For some people, change, it's uh, a passion and it's a life path, but for some only. For most of the people, change comes with fears, with doubts, even with suffering. People don't want to change unless it's needed, unless they are forced in many, many cases. And we, here we are asking to everyone in this planet, on this planet, to, to make a kind of a, to have faith and, and, and change. It's not that easy, but we know it's needed. And, and so the point is that uh, all the work we are all doing, what Sarah is doing, what we are trying to do is to, to to basically show elements that, that, that should help us not being fearful and, and try to change. Now, the other difficult thing is change in a direction that is common. So that change doesn't mean that we will all agree in which direction to go. Um, this is another point. And, uh, and uh, the, the issue in the food system, the issue of the natural resources, or, or let's say the, the resources, that's, uh, it's, it's, it, has, it has to be part of the equation, but we don't know yet exactly how to do it. So what we are trying to do with, um, we received a mandate from our ministry here in Rome at the, at the mission to try to animate a kind of uh, 
debate, call it in this way, we call it the bytes of transformation. Why bytes? Bytes is because we don't pretend to know the, to have all the truth. Um, so it's just some bytes, some element of transformation for the future. And in order to, to, to change a little bit the dynamic, what we did, what we are going to do next week is having 40 young, we call, call them change maker, maybe they will not be change maker, maybe yes, but young people that are not having not much to lose if you want. And they, we want to have a retreat with them and um, give some elements, but up to them to see whether they can offer us bites of transformation by throwing themselves into a future, into a future that maybe is distant. So uh, in a future that is most probably quite urbanized, in a future where diets might become more personalized because it will be more and more linked to our um, determinants of health and so on. So it's up to them then to bring some of the ideas on the floor and then will be discussed uh, next week towards the end in the Institute of Switzerland uh, in a meeting with experts that they will maybe uh, talk to them, even challenge them with their ideas. And, and from there, we see if some elements come out that can be very, maybe, we hope, useful for all the process we're going through in preparation of the Food System Summit, but also simply in shaping our future. It's simple to say, it's not easy to organize, even in COVID time. Um, but, uh, but we just do believe it, believe in uh, that there is energy and there is willingness to, to come up with ideas and, and, and offer some, some lights for changes without fear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pio. Uh, before I leave you, I would love you to share uh, a project that I really loved, uh, that I've seen you presenting a while ago, about how Swiss was tackling uh, one of the greatest issues we are facing, that is the water issue. Because when we're talking about food, uh, sometimes we forgive which are all the other related uh, issues. Uh, and I think that if you can just give us a glimpse of that project, uh, because uh, sometimes we just think about what's our action in our countries, but I think that the action of some wise countries uh, go much further, broader their borders. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose you're talking about blue peace. This absolutely initiative. yes, right. absolutely yes, because Maximo was talking about peace and to bring peace in the world, we need to give access to food, but also access to water. Sure, and water and food are very much related anyway. Exactly, exactly. So basically what we learned, we learned that Switzerland from our own mistakes. We made in the 80s, we basically through an accident, um, we, we basically made, I mean, yeah, we, we made a disaster um, on the river that, uh, that flows through Europe and touches nine countries. And from there, uh, we decided to, to work hard in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in working with others around the river basins and create um, common and shared experiences around the management of rivers. This implies accepting that transboundary management of waters is key. It's political and I think with, uh, with yeah. issues with perception of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of strategic issues and so on, but actually it's doable because it exists already. There are examples, basically in Africa, there are examples where waters are managed in a shared manner by different countries. And so what we, we did and what we are doing, we are pushing this concept um, and trying to have more and more collaboration that is not only transpander in terms of uh, uh, countries, but is transboundary in terms of sectors. So we develop programs, and actually we are getting there uh, uh, soon with uh, even uh, emitting the first uh, bonds that are multinationals, if you want, when in terms of multi countries uh, around uh, uh, river basin uh, management in Africa. And, and this comes with a shared plan. So the planned investment plan is among different countries and among different sectors. This means it has, has to be discussed through, and through a compromise. It implies use of waters 
to boost energy, irrigation, ecotourism in a shared manner, so in an agreed manner. And this is a first step, we think, that could be useful also for a process leading to a shared food system of the future. It's food systems are even more complicated, but this is it is doable. We see we with the with the experience we had, we see that it's doable. Blue peas, you can find it on the website around. Thank you. I hope it's it's clear. Thank thank you so much, Bio. And I think we are ready to hear the voice of the European and the European Alexandra Can um, you connect them? Yes. Do you hear me now? I hope I'm connected. Yes, we can hear you now. Super. And can you also see me? Of course. Okay, great. Because I don't see, I just have a black screen in front of me. Um, but I guess could be, uh, this could be for the browser, but however, I'll, uh, if you are able to hear us, will be uh, great, great. Well, I'm happy to be here and uh, with a little bit of hiccups. And even if you test beforehand, you see it doesn't work, always work exactly the same. Um, let me uh, first of all say, uh, start by saying that I'm really happy to be here to join this, uh, this wonderful worldwide conversation on, uh, on World Food Day. And uh, obviously a, a very special World Food Day. So by heartfelt congratulations to uh, the FAO on their uh, 75th uh, birthday. Um, and um, I think this is a, really a congratulations to all those FAO colleagues working um, throughout the world. Um, yesterday evening, I, uh, I walked past the FAO building and I already saw them uh, setting up some uh, um, some nice uh, birthday events, so I'm very much looking forward uh, to that. Um, but now on a more serious tone, I think this is also a very uh, important World Food Day because of the COVID pandemic. It has really tested our, the resilience of our food systems. It has re-emphasized to us, if that was needed, uh, how vulnerable we are, and in particular, uh, if our food systems are not sustainable and, um, and robust. Uh, we, uh, from the EU, we are really concerned about the current global negative trends as regards malnutrition and all its forms and food insecurity, as outlined in this year's State of Food Insecurity report. Um, I think um, uh, Massimo Torero said it uh, very clearly, and I can never do it as, uh, as clear as he can, but uh, hunger and nutrition have been uh, increasing globally, and food, food systems are under further pressure from the pandemic. Um, I think this is also um, really the reward. Uh, I get a message from the tech. Am I okay? Um, I think it just, uh, I'll just continue. Um, I think the reward for the Nobel Peace Prize for the World Food Program also serves to remind us of the desperate situation in that uh, 135 million people uh, in the world having, uh, f facing acute uh, food insecurity are still in. Let me just turn to, uh, to an EU perspective. Um, first of all, uh, focusing on the EU response to the, to the global pandemic. Um, the EU and its member states have provided a significant global COVID-19 response package for international cooperation that is currently uh, above 36 billion euros. This is known as Team Europe. It's the Team Europe package and it's really the global EU response to COVID-19 supporting partner countries and fragile uh, populations. Um, of course, the package mainly supports healthcare and general social economic recovery, but it also supports family farmers and vulnerable people for whom the EU is strongly committed to making our food systems more resilient and sustainable. Um, I think if we get our collective response to COVID-19 right, we can build back a better, more sustainable and equal world a world with enough and adequate food for all. Um, secondly, Sarah, as you mentioned, within Europe, we have made some uh, very strong commitments um, uh, these, these years. Uh, first of all, the, the European Green Deal, in which the, the European Commission has presented policy initiatives with the overarching aim of making the EU climate neutral in 2050. 
And uh, actually, a few weeks ago, they even um, uh, set the target uh, a bit higher at that we have to reach uh, this 55% uh, of reduction of greenhouse gas emissions um, by 2030. Um, it's really, it, it, it will mean a lot of change, a new legislation on circular economy, biodiversity, farming and innovation. Um, underneath that, uh, the, the From Fark to Fork Pol uh, strategy, as you, as you mentioned, and which is the title of this, uh, this hour's session, is really um, a key policy area with a vision to make Europe's food system sustainable in a true economic, social and environmental sense. Um, there are specific targets, including the decrease of the use of chemical pesticides, reducing food waste, increasing the availability of healthy food options, improving soil fertility and increasing the area of land being used for organic farming. And then um, linked to that is the biodiversity strategy, focusing on management of forests and maritime areas, environment protection, and addressing the issue of losses of species and ecosystems. Uh, so all these are, are really um, uh, very interlinked and, and form our roadmap for, um, for the coming years to, towards more healthy people, healthy societies, and healthy nature. Um, then just moving to our international uh, efforts, because uh, we really um, uh, yeah, also want to bring uh, our, 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 our strategy, our, our vision uh, to the international stage and uh, hopefully inspire discussions. I think the Food Systems Summit coming up is really a, a great platform um, to discuss these issues, um, certainly because they're not unique to the European Union. And uh, so we hope to engage through dialogue, cooperation and support in, um, in jointly working uh, towards reaching that uh, Agenda 2030 that we all agreed to and a world uh, without hunger. Um, let me just highlight, I'll be very brief now because uh, a few points of, of the, our, our vision for this building the future together and which will really be the vision that uh, you will also hear us uh, promote in the Food Systems Summit. So we're looking for a future where food systems are sustainable, resilient and inclusive, where they deliver healthy diets for all without impacting the environment and the climate, and where they offer a decent living for farmers and workers along the entire food supply chain. And for that, we believe we should focus on four points, digitalization and innovation based on science and evidence-based solutions, protecting biodiversity, genetic resources, and natural ecosystems, promoting diverse innovative approaches, including agroecology, and effectively implementing the one health approach, which uh, realizes that animal health and human health are inseparable and with, that we need to combat antimicrobial resistance uh, and address and treat uh, zoonotic diseases, for instance. Um, yeah, I... Uh, I had, I think, I just maybe one point on the role of women in all this. As yesterday was International Rural yes. Women's Day, and I think that's um, because women account for a substantial proportion of the agricultural uh, labor force. So I really want to to focus that uh, we we need to uh, also look at women and girls in rural areas who suffer disproportionately from food insecurity and multidimensional uh, poverty. So I think um, that really is, is, a, is something overarching um, to, um, to take into account in our, in our vision and in uh, our priorities for the, the Food Systems uh, Summit. Um, I think, yes, once again, the Food Systems Summit, I think, is really a landmark for the transformation of today's food systems. And we support the bottom-up, inclusive, multi-stakeholder approach that um, the UN... Uh, uh, that the special envoy has is, is promoting and uh, I think we really together we have to walk the extra mile for once again healthy people healthy societies and healthy nature thank you thank you so much thank you so much I think that we started with the voice of FAO and then we we heard the voice uh, of Switzerland uh, understanding how much also they are doing uh, really engaging the broader society and then uh, the voice uh, of uh, Europe, but there is a strategic asset for all of us that is Mediterranean also. And I think it's really important to highlight it 
because uh, for Europe, Mediterranean is a crucial uh, element that is embodying a lot of values, culture, but is also facing uh, a lot of issues uh, in the coming year. And uh, so I decided to invite with us also the president of Prima Foundation, because I think that uh, we need to hear also the voice of Mediterranean. So I invite here on stage virtually Professor Angelo Riccaboni, who's the president of Prima Foundation. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased of this invitation to this very nice worldwide conversation. Thanks to UN Food Systems Summit 2021 and to Future Food Institute. As you said, the Mediterranean is a key area. Unfortunately, after the Arctic is the area of the world where the consequences are the consequences of the climate change are bad. So. Uh, and also the, the Mediterranean is an area which is warming 20% faster than the global average. We have issues in terms of uh, even uh, nutrition because of the Mediterranean is the cradle of the Mediterranean diet, but we, we have 20% of people suffering from obesity, which means 95 million people. We have uh, major issues in terms of uh, loss of biodiversity and in terms of uh, uh, management of water. We have a uh, consumption by 70 or 80 percent or 90 percent in some counties of water by agriculture with many problems in terms of uh, use and efficiency of use of water. So we have major issues and they are common to all countries. So as you said at the beginning, we need to work together. So the reason why this initiative called PRIMA partnership for research innovation in the Mediterranean area was launched was to work together in order to put together brains, laboratories, money, ideas, because uh, I mean, these problems uh, refer to Algeria and uh, Morocco, refer to uh, France and Italy. You cannot, uh, I mean, these issues do not know borders. So we need to work together, which is not very easy, as we know, in the Mediterranean. But after some time, we were able to build up this initiative. This initiative is funded by 19 countries from the Mediterranean, from the Euro-Mediterranean area, and the European Commission. So as Alexandra said before, Europe is very, very concerned about uh, sustainability, about sustainable food systems. So we are working together according to a major principle, which is the principle of equal footing, which means that we have uh, all the same rights, we decide together, we manage the, the, the program together, we govern the program together, and we make the decisions together. And what we uh, are doing, we are working on three pillars, which are sustainable farming, efficient use of water, and valorization of food supply chains. And in a, we have a budget of a half a billion euros put by the European, the Euro Mediterranean countries, the 19 countries I mentioned before, half and half by the European Commission. And for seven years, we will be launch calls in order to fund and promote research innovation in sustainable food systems. This is the framework. Within it, we have already had two years of, of our calls. So we have already funded 83 projects and we have funded for more than 100 million euros. So what it means, it means that we have 740 research and innovation teams working together in the Mediterranean in order to tackle major challenges of the area. And this is very important because only working together we can make it. So I'm going to conclude. And what I'm seeing is that there are areas like uh, uh, analysis of genotypes or sustainable breeding or prevention of rabbits among, uh, prevention of diseases among rabbits or valorization of the supply chain of uh, uh, camel milk or uh, valorization of uh, cheese supply chain. So we have concrete, we have concrete projects on concrete themes. And I think it's a very interesting beacon of hope that countries 
researchers, the commission, they work together in order to solve problems. Because, and I close with that, research innovation are very, very important for our future and for more sustainable food systems. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Angelo. And uh, before going in the next half of the session where we're gonna talk about how might we empower people, I wanted to hear just one last word from all of you. I started this morning asking who are the voices that uh, yet are not heard or who are the voices that you wanna see involved? Because this journey that we are kicking off today is gonna to be a journey that is gonna take us all around the world, not only today, but for the entire next year because at the summit in 2021, we really would love to have the entire world connected because we understand that SDG number 17 is the most important one. So starting from Maximo, who are the ones that you really would love to hear, the ones that you would love to have around the table to really take this step that is needed? Thank you, Sara. Uh, uh... I think uh, and one of the goals of the summit is to do a bottom-up summit, not to have the voices of everybody. But for me, if I have to make a choice, and you always have to make choices, uh, what I want to hear right now is what is the voices of all these people that are informal workers, both in rural and pre-urban areas, which are struggling with the crisis that we are living, uh, and how they are coping. I, I, I am still amazed of how these people are coping the situation because I think we need to learn from them uh, at this point. Uh, imagine you're an informal worker and you go into a lockdown. There is nothing you can do. But these people are coping and that's amazing. So I just would like to hear how they are doing because we need to learn from them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maximo. You are completely right. And then um, Alexandra. Yes, thank you, Sara. Um, well, I think I, I partly answered your question already in, uh, in my first intervention, but uh, let me repeat. Uh, I think indeed the, the fact that in the Food Systems Summit, uh, the idea is to have as many voices heard as possible through the Champions Network, through different um, the action tracks where a lot of uh, uh, representatives from civil society are involved. So I think that's really, really great. Um, I'd like to highlight um, a rural women that uh, I, I mentioned. I think that is uh, really uh, important to have their voices heard and the youth. Um, because if you look at, at the, the bold steps that have been taken in the European Union, um, I think um, part of that, or maybe a large part of that, is because we've seen some very active young people standing up for climate change. So uh, their voices, the voices of the future, I think really need to be heard in, um, in these discussions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Pio. <laughs> Thank you for asking the question. Um, so, of course, it's a people summit. This is, this is the mandate, okay? But actually, instead of just hearing voices, I would like to receive and feel the pressure the forcing us as leaders to comply with our mandates. This is what I'm wishing. Thank you. Good, good point. <laughs> and last but not least, Angelo. Well, uh, as I said before, innovation is a very important for the future of uh, smallholders, for the future of uh, food uh, companies, small food companies. So I would like to listen to the voice of innovators, of smallholders who are so smart to introduce new ways of producing, new ways of organizing themselves, uh, organizational innovation. Because if we show that they are good, that they can make it, others will copy them, others will emulate from them. So I think it's very important to give the floor to those who are able to understand that through innovation, you can be sustainable and profitable because profitability is key for the future of farmers. It's true. And we always say that innovation is a cooperative effort. So this is for sure the key. Thank you so much. But then to make all of things, these things happen, we need to start from empowering people. 
And so I wanted to have with me today, Christina Petraki, who's the director of the FAO eLearning Academy, who's a massive source of information and learning uh, that is available for all everywhere in the world, accessible for all. And is also our amazing partner. And with her, we started the Climate Shapers uh, Initiative. Christina, please share with us which are the capacity we need to build around the world to make this change happen. Thank you, thank you all, all very much for this opportunity. And uh, I would like actually to come back to what was mentioned by Alexandra about all the humanities challenges that were mentioned. So as you know, we need to, there are a number of, of, of challenges that humanity is facing, um, um, among which food, uh, food insecurity, of course, remains one of the main ones, food losses, food waste. And as she was mentioning also, we need sustainable food systems which are inclusive, which put at their center uh, the nutrition and health status of, of, uh, of citizens, but also uh, we have to deal with all the climate change issues, uh, governance uh, of, uh, of tenure, management of natural resources, gender inequalities, youth employment. So the challenges are many, and this is why FAO has uh, created the FAO eLearning Academy that offers uh, free online uh, e-learning courses to basically support professionals throughout the world uh, in, in facing these challenges. We are mainly focused on competences. We look at the professional profiles that are required today to face uh, the various challenges. And, and the, the courses are, are competency-based courses. So the idea is really to strengthen the capacities of people uh, we need professionals that are able to, rake, to take the right decisions. We, are, we need professionals that are able to formulate the right policies, the right strategies, and for that you need competences. So this is exactly what, what we are trying to do. We support all the SDG framework, of course, and in particular SDG 4, which is universal education. What we are trying to do is free for anyone anywhere in the world at any time, and also a global public good for the benefit of everyone. This is not, uh, the FAO eLearning Academy is not only the result of FAO's efforts. We work with more than 200 partners in this initiative. And so far we have reached over 600,000 users uh, throughout the world. We cover all the thematic areas that were mentioned also before me. So. Uh, everything related to uh, sustainability, sustainable food value chains, climate change, uh, child labor, uh, trade, investments, markets, uh, forest management, fisheries. So all these various thematic areas are, are covered. And um, just to let you know, I mentioned that we work with many partners. We work, we are trying to really work with different stakeholders. So we work with the UN and development agencies, with universities with whom we have developed uh, masters and postgraduate degrees that are using these courses, NGOs and CSOs, but also a uh, private sector is now very uh, interested in compliance to sustainability. So this is also a very good sign. So uh, we are trying to really, everything we do is done collaboratively with, multi with a multi-stakeholder and collaborative approach uh, in the design of our interventions, in the development, in the implementation. This is really key, I think, uh, to, um, th this is the geographic distribution of our learners. And um, I wanted just to mention this very quickly, that uh, governments, I also, 15% uh, of our 600,000 users are from government. So um, it means that uh, they are using the courses to formulate policies sustainable policies. In fact, this is a very interesting information. And also 20% are university and academia, and 25% are from uh, NGOs. Uh, I just wanted to mention also that we combine different methodologies. We try to bring innovation. So this brings me back uh, to what uh, uh, Angela was mentioning and also Alexandra about the importance of innovation but also the importance to really target specific competences uh, if we really want to, to face the challenges. 
So just to let you know that we use different methodologies, I'm not gonna go uh, into the details, uh, but um, we also have a number of courses on the SDG indicators to support countries on how to monitor their progress towards uh, sustainability. So this is also uh, quite in demand and very successful. And uh, very quickly, I just wanted to conclude by, uh, by mentioning also that we are uh, now considered uh, an official certifying body. So we are able to certify and what we certify is the acquisition of competences. So we, um, once you get these, we do it with the digital badge systems. Once you get these badges, it's part of your professional profile. You can have it in your LinkedIn, in your CV, in your e-portfolio. It becomes part really of your, your pool of, of skills and competences. Uh, these badges are, of course, um, the result of, of tests that you need to pass, which is competency-based and scenario-based. And the badge is uh, digital. It's um, digital and it is uh, database-driven. So um, this is just uh, very quickly to show you that we have delivered a number of badges for the different uh, thematic areas that I was mentioning before. These are the badges we have designed for the SDG indicators. And uh, very quickly, just if you want to have more information about what we do, I'm mentioning the, uh, some of our publications. And uh, if I have to conclude, I would say that, um, first of all, there is a common thread in everything we do, which is sustainability. Sustainability is in all our interventions, in all our e-learning courses. It is really the common thread. But for sustainability and for development in general, we need competences and we, we need uh, professionals which are able and capable of uh, basically taking the right decisions, formulating uh, the right policies, bringing innovation, and really um, to, in order to, to, to face uh, the global challenges. So this is what I wanted to share with you in five minutes. And uh, But thank you very much for, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Thank you so much. Also, because uh, to achieve the goals, we need to upscale and uplift our skills. And we have now a tangible example. And I want to say, invite Julia and the Climate Shaper with us, because uh, say together with Christina, with FAO, we have been starting this incredible experience, uh, organizing boot camps and, and programs to empower not only youth, uh, but people around the world really to transform every inspiration into an actionable thing, really achieving the SDGs. And a lot of projects are coming out of this experience. And so, Julia, please share with us. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome, everyone. Happy Vertful Day. I am Julia Dalmadi, the Director of uh, Community Programs at Future Food and also um, um, the leader of the, the Food and Climate Shaper um, Boot Camps, which is a joint project between the Institute in, and the FAO eLearning Academy. Besides that, I'm also a graduate of the Food Innovation Master Program, which is another educational program the Institute uh, done before. And today, exactly two years ago today, I was at FAO um, presenting with three fellow students um, the research foundings of our Food Innovation uh, Global Mission at the Global Forum of Agriculture um, on Agricultural Research and Innovation. That year for me was uh, learning how to dance with ambiguity and learn the value of curiosity, connections and courage. Now, this year, it was my honor to actually join um, the team uh, running the boot camps and give this opportunity, this transformational learning opportunity to others. This year was also challenging our resilience. So, our, one of our best decisions was um, shift our boot camps into a digital format and actually give the chance to 37 participants from almost 30 countries with completely different backgrounds to um, join um, one digital uh, virtual classroom and learn about critical thinking, uh, prosperity thinking and ecosystem mapping, provide them with tools how to simultaneously apply the knowledge, what we deliver about climate smart oceans, cities, kitchens, and farms in their local communities. 
run local discoveries, give voices to other uh, climate shapers in their immediate uh, environment, in, invite them to, to a climate supper and have conscious conversations about food like we have um, today. During this four week program, they also uh, had to phrase their own climate shaper challenge and work on that in a format of a hackathon. And this is where um, I would like to introduce um, some of our climate shapers. We actually met a few already um, a few hours um, ago. They were one of the teams who were actually in the three winning team um, during um, the hackathon in July. And uh, before we start their pitch, and they will tell you more about Tasty Teaching, I would like to encourage everyone who now got inspired and would like to become part of the Climate Shaper community to see, uh, see and uh, check the application for the next batch, which will start on the 30th of October. And now, because I know we have uh, trying to keep time uh, in mind, I would like to invite you to listen to the pitch of Tasty Teaching. Hi, my name is Marku and we are Team Tasty Teaching. We are an international team of experts in food science, culinary arts, human psychology and community building. A study conducted by Harvard University stated that life expectancy can be lowered by 10 to 25 years due to poor mental health. Poor mental health increases physical and emotional distress which results in a high intake of food high in fat and sugar. In contrast, the study also stated that healthy eating can increase life expectancy by 12 to 14 years. Our solution is to promote mental well-being and health through mindful eating and cooking. More than ever, mental health and well-being has been negatively affected by COVID-19 and has resulted in more poor food choices globally. We want to turn the tide on this phenomena by using food as a tool instead to promote mental well-being and therefore healthier food choices. We will use a multi-channel strategy to reach our target audiences. For example, bringing to food, easy and fun food games, Empowering the local community superheroes to educate themselves and others, as well as selling food workshops designed to promote mental well being for corporates. Here's a picture of a prototype we did with Google India looking at food in a different way. The main goal of this exercise was using meditative and empathy cooking techniques. We are currently working on four products, namely culinary meditation, food gamification, culinary de-stressing and cook along for rapid prototyping and getting feedback. We are doing this through a focus group which includes various corporates. Here are some quotes from our potential target markets expressing their interest. For example, Google has stated that mental health is a top priority in the company, but they haven't found a fun and interesting way to promote it, especially in relation to food. Tasty teaching will be mainly focusing on sustainable development goals 3, 4 and 17, but we do wish to accomplish 2 and 12 in the near future. Here you can see our founding partners, our potential brand, and our validated potential partners from various organizations and university. Here's a brief summary of Tasty Teaching's timeline. Currently, we are ideating our focus group before moving to group initialization and corporate networking. Early next year, we hope to start our corporate and community prototyping and potentially launching a product near the end of 2021. Our immediate needs. For Tasty Teaching to grow, 
you would need focus group collaboration, as well as collaboration through think tank and feedback loop. And lastly, pre-seed funding for, for the development of our prototype products. Thank you for your time, and let's promote mental well-being and health through culinary pedagogy together. If you wish to contact us, please make use of the email address below. We are now open for questions. Buongiorno a tutti. Thank you. And now I would like to welcome on stage three of the team members, um, Gianave Ravindranath from India, Vivian Lung from Finland, and Evelina Padvanti from Italy. Hello, team. Hi, everyone. Can you hear? Can you hear us? Yes, 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 absolutely. Me as well. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone out there. So I think it's nice also to remark how this project came to life because we have been working together for more than a month last summer through our bootcamp. And this team came up really with a great idea from our perspective between, because the global pandemic have been really stressing out uh, people all around the world. We were facing so many issues, uh, but also we saw that food uh, can be sometimes not only a medicine from the nutrition perspective, but also can heal the society. And so, of course, many people have been affected also of mental illness. Uh, and uh, when at the end of the program, they came to life with this great idea, working together from South Africa, India, Finland, Italy, we were really astonished and surprised and we wanted to support them because uh, this is a great mission and uh, we wanted them uh, to share this idea with all of you. So guys, I thank you so much for joining this mission. I really, 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 really want to involve you to share your voice, uh, you need to join the global conversation and you need to become ambassadors of those messages in all of your countries. You need to join the global conversation and involve other people to join the conversation from now and, and the entire 2021. And within uh, the United Nations uh, Food System Summit, the, the big mission is really not only to hear the voices, uh, but uh, connect also the skills uh, and really make this change happen. So I thank you all for following this session and for following this incredible marathon that started early this morning. I thank you all uh, the representative of the institutions that were sharing with us this uh, session. I thank FAO for whatever you're doing around the world really to achieve uh, the SDG Zero Hunger, because this is, uh, of course, uh, one of the most relevant issues of our era. And this is something that we can fix uh, if we're working all together. Thank you to the ambassadors of the European Union and the ambassador representing Switzerland at the United Nations agencies in Rome, and also to Prima Foundation for joining this conversation. Please continue following us. Uh, this uh, marathon is going to go all around the world. And now I'm going to hand over my light to the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thanks. Ciao. And all the best. All the best to all of you. Happy World Food Day.